Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 219. So this week it is of course the end of the month, so that means it's the long haul Patreon Dry Dock. So sit back, relax, choose a drink of your choice and hopefully enjoy. Jonathan Smith asks, the book Dog Boats at War mentions an unfortunate incident between some D-class MTB-MGBs and a friendly destroyer, ascribed in part to none of them operating their IFF systems, as distinct from challenging by signal light. I knew some aircraft of World War II carried IFF, but I think this is the first I'd heard about ships or boats with it. What kind of IFF systems did naval units have, and how effective was it, and how common was it to operate with it turned off? So there's quite an interesting story behind ship-based IFFs. It turns out, at least for the Allied side, that both the US and the UK were working separately on ship-based IFF transponders. And then when the US entered the war and technology sharing began in earnest, they realised, hey, we're basically duplicating each other's work. So they came up with a joint system, the Mark III IFF. So previous marks that you might see referenced are ones that were developed independently of each other mark three onwards at least for the wartime period were jointly developed systems now the way that the older systems and the mark three and forward systems worked was slightly different and that's actually explained in a period training film which i've linked in the video description below of the timestamp for this question so go and watch that if you want a little bit more detailed explanation but eff effectively the earlier IFFs worked by providing a strengthening pulse to an existing radar when it that radar was detected coming in. So if, bearing in mind, you're talking about a period when you're looking at an oscilloscope-style radar display as opposed to the PPI-style display we're more familiar with these days, so you just see a spike on your, on your line, and then if you switched on your IFF interrogator and that spike grew then that meant it was responding and if the spike stayed the same then that meant there was no response and that contact was an enemy. With the Mark III it was somewhat similar except that the Mark III was tuned to a separate frequency to standard radar sets so it could be operated without interfering with those radar sets and because it was off on its own frequency, it meant you could also code pulses to give specific identifiers. So you could have an identifier coded to say, this is a cruiser, this is a destroyer, this is a torpedo bomber, etc., etc. And other useful things, the training film mentions, for example, that you can send a distress signal over your IFF as well, if you so desire. And so when you're looking at ships in World War II, they would usually have a Mark III or a Mark V or something very similar. Um, sometimes type designations would vary in certain literature, but that's the core of it for the most part. In terms of effectiveness, as long as it was working and the person who was operating it was trained, it worked very well. However, it relied on a couple of things. One, obviously it relied on the transponder, the responding part actually working. And you don't necessarily know if that's working because in the Mark III and onwards it's only activated when it receives a challenge pulse. So you can't just look at it and go, oh yeah, look, it's transmitting because it wouldn't be up until someone you know, sends the interrogation pulse. And of course, therefore, if you want the IFF system to work, then whoever is out there with a, the transmitting side of things, and you might have both the transmitter and the receiver on your ship, obviously, the, whoever's on the lookout for hostiles has to transmit the challenge in the first place. This can lead to potential causes for friendly fire because of course if something springs up out of the darkness your first thought might be to attack it rather than to waste potentially or potentially waste valuable time pulsing a IFF transponder signal at it to see if you're, they are friendly or not. Obviously, if they're hostile, that might be seconds that you might make the difference between life and death. But obviously, also, if your transmitting equipment isn't working properly, that's going to be a bit of a problem. And you might choose not to use it because if you are not expecting to come across friendly craft or have friendly craft operating in the area, then, of course, any signal emission you make is potentially a signal emission that the enemy might pick up on and use to home in and triangulate on your position, which 
could be quite a major problem. So in some ways similar to the way that submarines would operate by staying out of certain areas and working in certain other areas, likewise if you were expecting to be sort of the lone vessel or you were going to have line of sight contact with a few other vessels and you were operating close into the enemy coast, you're probably not going to be using your IFF systems as a rule unless you think maybe you're going to come under attack by friendly aircraft because it's radio emissions, it's potentially going to give away your position. Whereas if you're in more general waters or in friendly waters, you're going to be much freer with your use of the IFF systems. And so, unfortunately, there was obviously various opportunities for miscommunication and friendly fire to result. But when it worked, it was usually pretty good. Uh, but as I've mentioned before, the enemy could also exploit it like I've said previously, with uh, the Japanese towards the end of the war basically being able to map out a good chunk of where American aircraft were because they are able to duplicate the challenge pulses from various IFF systems in use in the Western Pacific. Nick Brodar asks, Compared to battleships, it's easy to see why destroyers are called tin cans, but where and when did the nickname originate? Well, the tin can nickname originated in the US. Exactly who came up with it i'm not entirely sure but looking through period references to destroyers in the early 20th century it seems that the phraseology tin can for destroyers pops up some point in the mid 1910s around about the time that the u.s enters world war one there are one or two potential references before that in sort of 1915 1916 but most of the literature in well in fact all the literature that i can find in the 1900s and a good chunk of the literature in the early 1910s mostly uses a related phrase which is tin box so they call them tin box destroyers and so forth and that seems to say to transition around about the mid to late 1910s into tin can destroyers, and then they drop the can, the destroyer part, and it just becomes tin cans thereafter. The Hand of Ray asks, How would the situation have changed if the Washington Naval Treaty only regulated the tonnage of individual ships and not the overall tonnage or the number of ships allowed? It probably would have gone very, very badly, because... Capping the number of ships, period, that everyone was going to build was one of the primary aims of the Washington Treaty. So if you're not putting a limit on overall tonnage or a limit on overall numbers of ships, you're just saying, well, we all agree that X ship type can only be Y tonnage, then the naval arms race that everyone was worried about is going to continue because, okay... Lexington, South Dakotas, G3s, N3s, Kargitosas, etc. They're all still going on the scrap pile, assuming for the moment that everyone agrees on the same individual tonnage as they did before, namely for capital ships, 35,000 tons. But it means that actually there's now, to a certain degree, a cost cap on the development of ships. And that means you can build more ships for the same money, which means that somebody inevitably is, probably the Japanese, um, to be honest, and then everyone else is going to be trying to one-up each other. The situation between the US, Japan and the UK in some ways is analogous to the situation between Germany, France and Italy in the 1930s, in that you know Japan want, is kind of, I suppose, Japan is in the place of France, to a certain degree, not necessarily in terms of overall balance of forces, but certainly in terms of desire for ships. Because if you take the US and the UK as roughly having the positions of Germany and Italy, Japan wants a fleet that's just about strong enough to keep the Western Pacific secure and in its field of influence. Um, we're assuming, again, for the moment that the treaty also requires the Anglo-Japanese treaty to be broken up. But in so doing, by Japan expanding its fleet, that is going to prompt 
one or the other, probably the US, because they have more interest in the Pacific, to up their own fleet to try and maintain superiority. If the US ups its fleet, then Britain is going to up its fleet, which now means that both powers that Japan could be squaring off against have larger fleets, which means Japan would need to enlarge its fleet, which would prompt the US to enlarge its fleet, which would prompt the British to enlarge their fleet, and so on and so on in an infinite spiral upwards. Now, at some point, the Japanese economy will crash and burn under the weight of so many ships being constructed. They just do not have the resources or the economy to keep up with the other two. However, it is going to prolong that race because everybody has the infrastructure to build 35,000 ton capital ships. You know, the Japanese obviously already, well, they all obviously already had the facilities to build bigger because they were building bigger, but something the size of Nagato, a Colorado, or a slightly larger than Queen Elizabeth size hull, easily in the capabilities of all three. So what's probably going to happen is Japan will start building something that's part way between a Nagato and a Tosa in relatively large numbers. The US will obviously complete USS Washington and build some kind of, again, slight follow on to the Colorados. The British will in turn respond probably with something resembling a 16-inch armed version of the Queen Elizabeth's or related design. And everybody will build until one of them, I guess again, probably Japan drops out, at which point the US and the UK will have a choice of do they stabilize in a position where their fleets are roughly on parity with each other and superior to the Japanese, or do they continue a two-horse race ad infinitum until, again, one or both of their own governments goes, this is dumb, we should probably stop just building ships because we can. Which, all things considered, given the uh, Wall Street crash, etc., is probably going to be some point around the mid... Uh, well, not the mid-1930s, the middle of the interwar period, so 1930-31. Trevor Polasek asks, How good were the doctors aboard Royal Navy ships during the Age of Sail? What kind of training or education did most of them receive, and how did they compare to their land-based counterparts? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, the long answer, well, the slightly longer answer is it varied hugely. There is actually a distinction. These days you say doctor, surgeon, physician in the common parlance. People tend to think of it as roughly the same thing. That wasn't the case back then. A physician was someone with a degree and mostly dealt with what these days would be called internal medicine. Um, to questionable effect. I mean, this is still the era where people were prescribing things laced with mercury. Um to cure certain ailments so yeah if you were treated by a physician you know it was a 50 50 that you might describe despite what the physician did to you or you might survive because of what they did to you or something in between or you know in trying to treat you they might do something hor horrific to you that might actually solve the problem but in a completely unintentional way such as you know if you were poisoned they might try and give you the anti an antidote, but an antidote might make you so horrifically and violently sick that you actually end up expelling all of the poison before it can do much else to your system. But nevertheless, um, a surgeon was basically someone who had a worryingly sharp array of worryingly shaped tools and was very good at removing things from people, usually limbs, but it could be other bits and pieces as well. Uh, now, to be a surgeon, you effectively had to convince the navy that you could read you had sharp tools and you could take a leg off with you know at least a 50 percent survival rate uh, there was a tiny bit more involved in it but not tremendously more and so you know it it wasn't that difficult to get a surgeon aboard now if you were really lucky you might have a either well you'd have a physician who also had surgical skills who possibly actually subscribe to the idea of evidence-based medicine i.e you know i feed a person this thing they keep dying i feed the person this other thing they occasionally get better so maybe i don't give them the first thing anymore and if so if you were really really lucky you might have someone who had held what for the time passed for a medical degree and might be able to therefore deal with infectious diseases and so forth to a certain extent 
and at least actively wouldn't make those situations worse, especially if they had a good supply of laudanum around. And if they then also had surgical skills, they could take your leg off if it got shot as well, which was all to the good. On the other hand, you might, if you were, your ship was desperate or ill-equipped or your previous surgeon had, had something happen to them, you might end up with person who has some experience cutting up meat, which on occasion could either be someone who'd blagged their way into the position by fooling or bribing someone in the Navy, although why you'd want to do that I'm not entirely sure because it wasn't the world's best paid position, or someone who just had experience carving up things on a butcher's table. So you have accounts from some ships where you'll see people saying things like, well, you know, we had 12 wounded in the aftermath of this action and nine of them survived thanks to the care of our surgeon, which would be good. And then you have other accounts, uh, one of which read, our surgeon had neither the knowledge of his craft nor the knowledge of anything else of use and we were glad to put him ashore. Chris Balance asks, was there a Royal Navy reaction to the North Sea operations of the Spanish raiders Nadir ex Ciudad de, la v de Valencia and Ciudad de Alicante in late 1938? and any repercussions to the sinking of the merchant ship SS Cantabria off of Cromer in Norfolk. On the broad spectrum, not really. The attitude of the British government seems to have generally been it's a Spanish civil war, they will attack each other, it is what it is unless and until it actually affects Britain directly. The Germans, of course, were giving Franco's raiders uh, safe haven in German ports, which is why they were operating in the North Sea in the first place. But in terms of specific reactions, because bear in mind, you know, even with the action we're about to talk about, questions were raised in Parliament and the government's reaction was like, yeah, it happened. Why is it any business of ours, effectively? <laughs> but because the sinking of the Cantabria almost but not quite entered British territorial waters, there was a Royal Navy force dispatched to try and to, to the area to make sure that further actions didn't take place in British territorial waters. So the official Royal Navy reaction was, if things take place on the high seas, not our business, unless, of course, British property or British citizens are involved. And if it took place close to British waters, then very similar to the French ironclads, during the American Civil War with the fight between Alabama and Kearsarge, they basically would show up and go, well, OK, fight it out amongst yourselves, just not in our waters, thank you very much. You can see here the Nadia, ex Ciudad de la Valencia, in a very basic form of camouflage that it used. You can see they painted the central hull with a profile that looks like a smaller merchant vessel. Then they've painted the part of the stern much, much lighter and part of the bow still slightly darker but still lighter to give the impression at a distance that it's a smaller ship than it actually is. Now, when it comes to the sinking of the Cantabria, whilst the official reaction and the Royal Navy reaction wasn't that much bothered, there were some more grassroots reactions. So Nadia was initially actually seen off of its chase uh, of the Cantabria by a bunch of local fishing vessels, which basically played a game of chicken with the Nadir, which they won. And then later on, a British flagship showed up to rescue survivors of the Cantabria and cut off the Nadir from capturing at least one of the lifeboats. So you, you know, the, the general British seagoing population seemed to have taken sides to a certain degree, plus a little bit of at least one section of the government's stance leaked out somewhat in that Nadir, once it was blocked from capturing one of the lifeboats, went off to capture another one and the government issued, the British government, this is issued a statement that said that the Nadir's action in that particular part of the whole affair were illegal because it was interfering with a British ship rescuing lives at sea, which was held to have the priority, which is a technically correct reading of the law, but a very technical reading of the law, which effectively was telling the Spanish raid, Spanish raiders under Franco's flag that, yes, you can sink ships, but back off. We take priority of, you know, taking any 
anyone off of those ships, i.e. we're not letting them fall into your hands, which is sort of taking sides, although, as, as I say, I call this the position of at least one part of the government because other parts of the government were more in favour of the nationalists than the republicans, um, at least at first. So, yeah, British attitudes on the whole Spanish Civil War were very, very mixed, uh, much like, you know, with the American Civil War, where certain elements in power backed one side, but the general populace seemed to back another. Matt Kidd asks, The Midways had a much longer frontline service than the Essexes that entered service at, the, at close to the same time. On a scale of one being an Essex and ten being a Forestal, how do Midways rate in terms of capability in the post-World War II jet age? Now, with the big caveat, of course, that the channel doesn't really go past 1950 and my knowledge in detail of air ships' capabilities in the post-1950 environment drops off relatively dramatically, I would put the Midways at... I would say about... Compared to, if a Forestal is a 10, probably an 8 in the early part of the Cold War and then gradually trending downwards to maybe a five or six towards the very end of their careers. And that's largely because at the start of their careers, apart from some issues with sea keeping and stability, which the Forestals were in part designed to fix, the Midways, especially once they'd had their angled flight deck upgrades, the only thing that the Forestals had over them really was displacement. You know, they, they were a little bit bigger and therefore a little bit more capable. But um, they could operate the same numbers, the same type of aircraft, sorry, not necessarily in the same numbers, but they could operate the same type of aircraft and they could operate a good sized air wing. So at that point, you know, a few more aircraft, a little bit, little bit better sea boat, but the Midway is still a very, very effective carrier but then as you go on towards the last part of the cold war and the introduction of the f-14 the forestal appears to be the kind of entry level carrier for which you can conduct f-14 operations whereas the midway was the largest carrier that couldn't conduct routine f-14 operations although as i found out on my visit to uss midway it is actually technically possible to land an f-14 and then launch one again from a midway class it's just a little bit touch and go. So for that reason, since the F-14 made up a good chunk of the US Navy's fighter fleet in the latter part of the Cold War, the Midway's effectiveness drops somewhat, which in some ways is slightly ironic because, of course, if Midway and had stayed in service even longer for whatever reason, as the F-14 is replaced by the F-A-18 and the... Honestly, it's the same thing, FA-18 Super Hornet. Um, it probably could have gone back to operating a, at least a good chunk of the US Navy's frontline fighter resource, as, at least as far as I understand it. Um, again, the difference between the Hornet and the Super Hornet, it's not quite USS Puritan levels of trickery, but close to. Sworn brother of the Ballistic Order of St. John Moses Browning asks, how would a damage or punctured Belt, belt armour be replaced? Was it something that could be swapped out relatively easily, or would it require major teardown and reconstruction of the ship? And how would an internal belt affect the process? Would the new armour's integrity be up to par with the original, or would there be a weakness? And what about torpedo defences? How would crush tubes or a Pugliese system be more difficult to repair and or replace after it had absorbed a hit compared to other styles? Replacing the belt armour itself was actually a relatively speaking easy process as you can see here it comes in nice convenient slabs that are bolted on so if one of them has been ruined you send someone inside unbolt it that bit lift that plate off and any other nearby plates that might also have been damaged and lift new ones in it, it's actually one of the simplest <laughs> parts of repairing a ship the problem comes in that replacing that belt armour doesn't end with just the big slab of protective steel. If you've taken a major hit, especially a penetrating hit, there's a very good chance that significant portions of the ship behind the plate have been damaged or destroyed. 
it's, again, especially in the case of a penetrating hit, possibly completely, but even a hit that the armor's resisted may have warped, buckled, or bent uh, internal structural frames behind, which would also then have to be straightened out or more likely cut out and replaced. So the job of recreating the internal ship structure that goes behind the plate would actually be far, far more complex than replacing the plate itself. You see at Jutland, you know, non-penetrating hits that actually force in Ge uh, German belt armor to the extent that there are still leaks coming through, even though the belt itself is technically still in one piece, or the individual armor plates at least. Now, if the new armor's integrity is going to be up to par with the original, entirely dependent on the quality control of the armor manufacturer, but assuming that they did just as good a job making this plate as they did when they made the ship's original plates, then there shouldn't be any difference at all. Um, there shouldn't be any uh, weak seams or anything because these plates, as you can tell, they kind of fit up next to each other. Anything that is supposed to hold them together, like uh, strip plates or spot welds, if you want to do anything like that, is going to be cosmetic only. And of course, you're not going to be welding the outside of a hardened steel plate on the belt armor because that will ruin the hardening and that, that would make everything weaker. Now in terms of torpedo defenses, uh, crush tubes, again relatively simple, pull them out, replace them with new ones, um, assuming you want to do that. They wasn't exactly the world's best form of torpedo defense, but you know if you've got a socking great hole blown in the side by a torpedo, there's a fairly easy way to access the broken crush tubes. Now, the Pugliese system, compared to the standard liquid void, liquid void, etc. layers, that is a somewhat more complex animal because you're probably going to have to replace not necessarily the entire system, but a huge chunk of it. You've probably seen pictures on the channel before of just how much volume the Pugliese system takes up. And if that internal cylinder has crushed and there's probably damage to the supporting structure as well, you're basically going to have to carve out the entire system from the side of the ship in the vicinity where the hit's gone off, you know, up to however far along where it, where it, to where it's no longer been breached. And then you're going to have to rebuild it, and it's all going to have to be done in a very, very, very precise manner because it relies on precision engineering to function properly as opposed to with the liquid void liquid void traditional system where it's mostly hull plating and making sure that plating or potentially in some cases slightly heavier plating than hull grade it has been replaced is vaguely watertight and intact and where applicable any pump systems have or been replaced or piping or whatever basically it's a lot easier to repair a standard torpedo defense system than it is the Pugliese system. Internal belt armor, like you see on the US battleships, basically everything I said in regards to the external belt armor, with the exception that obviously there is some kind of external structure as well, and so all of that may need pumping out and or patching, replacing, fixing, etc. on top of dealing with the actual armor itself so the an internal armor belt will be more difficult to repair but if you're in a battleship grade engagement the overall additional work to repair an internal belt system is probably not spectacularly that much greater compared to the internal restructuring and rebuilding you're probably going to have to be doing the flip side is that if a ship with an internal belt system got involved in a close range firefight a la let's say the first night action the first night bat the first action of the night battle of Guadalcanal which is always a weird thing to say because of course Versavo Island was also part of the battle of Guadalcanal and was also a night action but the one with Hiei and Kirishima and Laffy and all of that lot um if a uh, Iowa or a South Dakota etc got involved in a fight like that where you have small ships pelting it with uh, gunfire then in that particular case a externally belted vessel like the older ships or King George V or something would be much easier to re repair because that caliber of gunfire at least when it comes to the belt armor is 
almost certainly not going through, at which point, if you need to replace belt uh, armor plates at all, you'll just be swapping the belts in and out. Whereas with the internal belted ship, you're, again, maybe or maybe not having to replace the internal belt, but you are going to have to be doing a lot of pumping out and patching up of the external hull work that is outside of the belt. Jim Smitty asks, in your video in USS Salem, it seemed that the US Navy was so hell-bent on keeping Flash from reaching the magazines that they didn't have any clear or easily seen way of getting fresh air to the people working in the magazines. So how were you supposed to keep breathing in the magazine, or did you have to wear something like scuba gear and just accept that if your hose is cut, that's it? Or is there something simple that I overlooked? Now, unfortunately, I didn't take massively detailed pictures of the ceiling inside the magazines. There are some photos that do have parts of the ceiling in it, but not the whole thing. However, there was this rather handy safety precaution sign on the side of the magazine, which I did take a photograph of. And there are two sections of it that are particularly relevant to your question. Firstly, uh, section one, it says safety... Obviously, keep all safety devices in good order at all times. Safety devices include sprinkling system, watertight doors, flameproof scuttles, ventilator covers and controls, etc., etc. And then if you go down to uh, 16, when firing, magazine blowers shall be shut down and exhaust and supply covers of branches to magazines and handling rooms shall be closed. So from that, and from what I recall of the ceiling layout of the magazine aboard Salem, it basically seems that the cooling was always controlled by those passive cooling uh, devices that I showed, basically water-cooled fins, very similar, in fact, almost identical in purpose and overall technology, albeit just on a lot slightly larger scale to the passive cooling arrays you get in uh, computers these days. But the, it, from that reading, it also seems to be that there were ventilators at least for getting fresh air in and out not i.e because you've got ventilation systems for getting oxygen in so that people can breathe and you've got separate air conditioning systems i.e bringing large amounts of air in and keeping it cool so that the magazines say a regulated temperature so it's, it seems that on salem the temperature control portion was taken up by those passive systems but there was a system of getting fresh air into the magazines and handling rooms at least when the ship wasn't in action which presumably therefore could have been, could be trunked from elsewhere in the ship which means there's no direct line you know up to the upper decks of the ship or you know anywhere where there might be flash coming down but in action these things are closed off which then means that the magazine and handling room becomes a closed shop environment at least for the duration of the action and whilst the guns are being fired so at that point i mean you'd get a little bit of air exchange between the two compartments you know as the um transfer system worked but other than that you would just be working off of whatever oxygen was in there really and just hope that the total internal volume of the your working area was good enough that uh, it would last out the action, which, to be fair, it should. Um, uh, also, you know, the, the obvious caveat, you're more worried about CO2 poisoning than a lack of oxygen, but given the overall size of the magazines, even with people working hard in them, I, I would think you, if you've been in action long enough with the ship sealed long enough that... You're starting to worry about CO2 levels building up dangerously in a compartment that size. Yeah, the gun fight having gone on that long is probably the greater concern. Nathapon Hongsherion asks, Could you put Litorio's main turrets on the Scharnhorst? Unfortunately not. Um, not without significantly increasing the size of the barbettes. So the Bismarck and Scharnhorst barbette diameter is 10.1 meters give or take a handful of centimeters whereas the Latorio's barbette diameter which is obviously the barbette's what the um, turret's sitting on is 13.2 meters and obviously Scharnhorst has triple 11 Bismarck has twin 15 and Latorio has triple 15 so if you want to 
translate that into width of barbette versus number of guns, then crudely it works out that the Italian turret needs 4.4 meters of barbette width per 15 inch gun. The German turret needs 5.1 meters per 15 inch gun, which again, loosely speaking, means that the Germans need about 16% additional width per gun for their turret as opposed to the Italian one. So although the Italian layout is somewhat more efficient in terms of barbette width for the number of guns and the size of guns you fit on them, it is still somewhat larger than the German Twin 15, just not as large as it would be if it was a German Triple 15. Uh, for reference, in case you're wondering, the Americans managed to fit a triple 14 or a twin 16 into 9.5 meters internal barbette width or diameter. The British twin 15, as found on most of the Royal Navy in World War II, is just a fraction smaller by 6 inches. And the Nelson's triple 16 fitted into 11.75 meters of internal barbette width. Of course, you can also measure off of roller path diameters and outer barbette diameters, but the most coherent group of data that I could find was for the inner barbette width, so I've used all of those as a similar method of measurement. Andy Watkins asks, It's common knowledge that British armour-piercing shells were no good in World War I. Could you explain a little more as to what or why they failed and under what conditions they worked? After all, the German fleet did take quite a beating in the end. So I have covered this, I think, in previous dry dock questions. But to briefly summarise, there were two main failure types for the British shells. One of which was that the explosives they were using internally were perhaps or could be a little bit too sensitive so you did get a number of British shells that would detonate either immediately on contact or very 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 shortly after contact now of course armor piercing shells are meant to detonate shortly after contact but not quite that shortly uh, so you basically get external or near enough as makes no difference external explosions which could be one problem um, if the you know, the internal explosive just goes pop because it's supposed to be set off by the fuse. And then the fuse was the other problem. And the the very, very short version of that is that for a period of time in the late 18 and early 1900s, Britain obviously had friendly relations with Germany and they were buying fuses from Krupp. Unsurprisingly, circa the time that the Anglo-German naval arms race got going, in earnest, Krupp stopped selling fuses to the British and they had to develop their own, which meant British fuse development was playing catch up with everybody else's. And Jellicoe realised this um, in the run up to the war when he was in um, a shore position as one of the Sea Lords. But his project to correct that issue kind of died a death when he was moved off to a more active at sea command. So it didn't quite get sorted in time for Jutland. But again, the short version is that the British fuses, as they were equipped at Jutland, worked perfectly well as long as the shell impacted within a relatively narrow band of angle. So direct perpendicular, fine. 20 degrees off perpendicular, fine. More than 20 degrees off perpendicular, now you started having issues. And if the shell didn't just detonate on contact this is where you would you would have a problem where you'd have basically glancing well not even glancing but off angle hits which are obviously a lot more common in things like pursuits uh regardless of who's doing the pursuing and who is the pursued uh, than in a traditional straight up line engagement where okay you might still have over angle hits depending on exactly what you're hitting but broadly speaking you'd expect the impact angles in a broadside engagement to be closer to perpendicular than they would be in a chase and so when you combine those two problems this is why you have british shells not performing as they expected them to and thus although as you said you take a fair bat battering um if you're the germans there are a number of shell hits which either don't go off because the fuse has failed 
or they detonate early, and then if you map out where those shells should have exploded if the fuses had worked properly, it paints a rather different story about what could have happened to a fair number of the German ships. High Bacon Bomb asks, why were the Congos seen as such a threat to other nations, and in your opinion, what nation built the best looking ships? As I've said before, I think it comes down to when it, when you're looking at best looking ships, effectively personal choice, because almost every navy that's built any substantial number of warships has at times built some horrifically ugly vessels and also built some ships of absolutely aching beauty. So, um, and exactly which ones fall into which categories it depends very much on the eye of the beholder, but I don't think you can point to any navy that's built a substantial number of warships and go, they've always built good-looking warships, because that would be a blatant lie. But at the same time, none of the major navies have ever built a consistent run of horrifically bad-looking warships. They've had long periods, one way or the other, uh, in some cases, but they usually manage to churn out at least a few decent looking ships. Now, as far as the Congos and why they were considered such a threat, it depends on which nation you're looking at. Um, obviously, their ability to disrupt trade is a general problem, but for the US um, side of things, they were more concerned about, as you probably have seen from the fleet problems videos so far, the possibility of the Congos getting into close contact with US carriers and sinking them, as well as destroying cruisers, which were both their own scout forces and the screening forces for carriers. So a Congo could blow its way through a carrier's fleet screen, sink the carrier, could eliminate cruiser scouting groups. Basically everything that the US had in its scouting force was vulnerable to a Congo, and for the majority of their careers, they were fast enough to run down pretty much anything that they stumbled across, especially assume, if you assume that they were running at speed, and maybe their targets were running at cruising when they came across each other, and even though there were the occasional periods where the Congos maybe wouldn't be able to outrun you in a flat chase, again, if they're coming in hot and you're coming on, on cruise, you're probably going to be caught before you can work up a speed to escape them and that's only for a very limited window of time and in all the time that they were around they were certainly fast enough to outpace any US battleships which were the only ships that the US Navy in the interwar period had that were capable of actually killing the blasted things in a one versus one at least that's how the theory went um <laughs> you know Guadalcanal aside so that's why the US saw them as a major threat um for the British, they still saw them in more of the threat role that a traditional battle cruiser posed, because the majority of the British fleet was concentrated in Europe and the Mediterranean at this point. They did have a presence in the Pacific as well. However, most of that presence was cruisers, and of course the Congos were very, very, very capable of killing cruisers. Therefore, they were a, a major threat, and once again, they could to toodle on out there to escape any kind of retribution the British could bring to bear, albeit with the exceptions of Renown, Repulse and Hood, which obviously the British did have, but there were only three of them, and it was exceedingly unlikely that the British would ever end up in a situation, at least where they were starting a war, with all three deployed to the Western Pacific, and even if they did, well, there are three of them and there are four Congos, which meant that, apart from anything else, the Japanese could have a Congo in one more place than the British did, assuming that both sides had all of their battle cruisers out at sea at the same time. Matt Osborne asks, Could you please explain the transit of Cape Horn by sail? Voyager seemed to touch on the eastern or western shore of what is now South Africa, turn south and go far out to sea before returning north in a great arc, to round the horn. What wind or tide conditions made people round the cape this way rather than hug the shoreline? So given that you talk about what's now South Africa, I'm going to assume, also based on your description of things, that you're talking about the Cape of Good Hope, because Cape Horn is the tip of South America. <laughs> but assuming that we're going 
with the questions body, most talking about South Africa, the reason that a sailing ship doesn't really go around the tip of South Africa hugging the coast is because, as you can see here, you have two very strong currents, one from the Atlantic, one from the Indian Ocean. They hit, they meet, and they cause all sorts of weird and wonderful weather phenomena. Uh, the place was originally called the Cape of Storms. They renamed it the Cape of Good Hope, um, in part to encourage trade and in part because well, no self-respecting mariner was ever going to go anywhere near somewhere that was bad enough that everyone had decided to call it the Cape of Storms. Um, so, yeah, the currents will drive you hither and yon. Um, the waves are equally crazy, going in all sorts of directions. The winds are completely contrary again, at least half the year. Half the year, at least, the winds generally have the good grace to come in from the same direction as the Atlantic current. But the other half of the year, they come in from a third direction compared to the other two currents with all the resulting uh, problems that result in that. Plus, you have, obviously, hot air coming off of the African continent and hence the original name. There's a ton of storms. So for most sailing ships, they kind of took one look at it and went, well, the wind is driving us towards the shore. The currents are possibly dragging us backwards, possibly forwards, possibly both at the same time, depending on where we are and what time of day it is and what alignment of the moon it is. Uh, the waves are coming from a completely different direction entirely. The coast is very empty and hostile. And, uh, you know, it might turn into a raging thunderstorm at any moment. So uh, we're going to give this bit a, bit a little bit of a wide berth and circle back on ourselves afterwards. Not to be fair that the passage along Cape Horn is much better, um, but uh, it's, it's especially bad off of South Africa. Little Dweller asks, I have recently read Empire of the Deep, The Rise and Fall of the British Navy by Ben Wilson. In it, he mentions a ship rating system in use in the latter half of the 17th century, which was somewhat different to the one used in the Napoleonic era. I hadn't realised that rates were used this early. Was the system actually formalised this soon? Or is it a case of historians using the term rate as a shorthand for ship sizes when such a system wouldn't have been used in contemporary descriptions? For reference, the rating system described by Wilson is a first rate 86 to 100 guns, second 54 to 90, third 52 to 74, fourth 32 to 46 or possibly 56, uh, fifth 26 to 32 and sixth 4 to 18. So there was a division system that was generated in actually the beginning of the 17th century and then modified during it, which I think is what is being referred to in the book. But it's a somewhat different division system compared to the rating system that we're a bit more familiar with. So initially, uh, this is 1603, so this is the very start of the Stuart period, very beginning of the 17th century, they actually divided the Royal Navy up into no less than 15 different groups, which were based entirely on the number of crew that a ship carried. That has you know, no strict bearing on the size of the ship. Uh, you could have a slightly smaller ship that just carried more crew, or you could have a bigger ship that carried slightly less crew, depending on how it was actually constructed, and obviously also had very little bearing on how useful that ship was. So you had ships like the Triumph, the Elizabeth, the Jonas and the White Bear, which were all at the top group, group one, because they had 500 or more men. But the Repulse, which was built in about almost half a century later and was of broadly a similar tonnage, was down in group three, even though as a race built vessel, it was probably far more useful to the Navy. Now, of those 15 groups, groups one and two became ships of the first rank. Um, groups three to five became ships of the second rank. Uh, groups six and seven became middling ships or third rank, and everything else became small ships or fourth rank. Later on, they split the fourth rank into fourth, fifth, and sixth ranks. And at round about the middle of the 17th century, then you start to see the change from rank to rate. The origins of what we're more familiar with as the rating system come about at the start of the 18th century with the establishment of 1706. And that's when ships start to be rated 
along the lines of how many guns they're carrying as opposed to the number of men they're carrying, although there has been something of a transition in how ships are treated during the 17th century. The formal establishment of the rating system, as we would broadly understand it, begins in 1706, although it and various other subsequent establishments, there's one in 1719, uh, there's one in 1745, and so on, um, and there's a few modifications as well in between, they are mostly, partly an attempt, well, mostly an attempt at economy, but also trying to set standard classes. So, you know, not only are they saying this is a second rate, this is a third rate, but they're also saying if you're going to build third rates, they must be of this particular um, size, displacement and armament so for example the 1745 establishment is has a single first rate that's a 100 gun ship a second rate is a 90 gun ship but there are two options for third rates you can have an 80 gunner or a 70 gunner but then that's it but within the establishment period comes to an end almost near enough on the dot of the middle of the 1700s and then you get the broader rating system develop out of that in the latter part of the 1700s. And that's where you still maintain the classification by gun size, but oh, sorry, by gun number. But there's no longer an attempt to say that a particular rate of ship must have exactly this many guns and must weigh exactly this and must carry exactly these these particular weapons it's more of a broader outline of between X and Y guns you are Z rate and that opens up obviously the possibility to have 74 gun third rates, 64 gun third rates, 80 gun third rates, mounting a variety of 32, 24, 18, 9 pounder guns etc. And then of course Victory with 104 guns or Caledonia with 120 guns both of which being first rates etc etc. SMS Schliessen asks Hi Drac, I recently took a ride on TSS Earnslaw at Queenstown, New Zealand. The engine room is open for visitors to look at. The ship's two propellers are driven by two vertical triple expansion engines. However, there is an extra steam engine using the steam coming out of one of the vertical triple expansion engines to run the condenser pumps. Is this common on early 1900 ships or just because Earnslaw is running on freshwater lakes? It's uh, relatively common actually on ships of the period and indeed slightly thereafter, because there was always a need for ancillary power of some description, whether it be running pumps or running machine tools on warships in the machinery room, etc. And so some kind of way of taking power out of the main engines and using it elsewhere was needed. In, for example, as you will see, if you're watching this at the time of release, you'll see in this upcoming Wednesday's video, on USS Olympia. Uh, she also has a similar setup and she's also VTE driven. And in turbine driven ships, initially this was common and would remain common uh, on a number of ships. For example, uh, aboard the Admiral Hipper class, they had quite a number of ancillary machines driven off of the steam coming off of the turbines. But as time went on, as you got into the 1910s and 20s, 30s, etc., more and more of these ancillary functions were determined to be able to be done using electricity, which meant that you could start using separate to petrol or diesel generators to generate power um, in order to, you know, run the whatever machinery it was you needed, or at the very least you could you know, spin off the steam power to run a dynamo to create the electricity, depending on exactly what you were doing in which ships and when. So, yes, it it's entirely in keeping with vertical triple expansion ships of the period to have a series of, of or in this case, at least one additional small engine that's using the waste steam from the main engines. Ferris asks, I've seen many contemporary accounts from World War II, for example Charles Lockwood, referring to the Hio class carrier conversions as Hiataka or Hiatake class carriers. This is surprising to me, as US Navy intelligence seemed to be pretty good at at least getting the ship's names correct. Was this a case of mistaken identity, or was there something else going on? 
it's basically a case of Japanese to English translation gone horribly wrong. So Junyo and Hio are peregrine falcon and flying falcon in Japanese, but um, as it turns out, the Japanese word for falconry is derived from their word for hawk, which is taka, um, so you can probably see where this is going. And of course, uh, peregrine falcon can be translated into Japanese as Hayabusa, which some of you might recognize as the KI 43's uh, cool code name. <laughs> so it was essentially a case of whether or not you're using falcon or hawk, the contextualization of how that goes with peregrine or flying, and various other issues with translation that led to this kind of Hayataka, Hiataka, Hiatake, Hitaka, various variations thereof which appear in various US manuals and indeed that is how the carriers were known um, for even a period after the war even though um, it is quite funny actually and of course yes Google Translate is going to be somewhat influenced by the fact that it's going to be using modern Japanese but you can put um, the characters uh, for Junyo into Google Translate in the Japanese section, translate to English, and it'll say, yes, this is Peregrine Falcon or Falcon. But then you switch it back over. So you literally just flip it around and ask it to translate Falcon or Peregrine Falcon back into um, Japanese from English. And it'll either say Hayabusa or something else, um, <laughs> which is hilarious. This is this is the wonderful thing about translating out of either into or out of non-Latin based languages into English um, or non-Northern non European languages into English. Contextualization can mean everything. So you can have either multiple words that translate to the same thing in English or you can have um, multiple concepts in English that translate into the same thing in that foreign language. So yeah, unfortunately translation issues there, but it all may, means pretty much the same thing. Bill Luster asks, have you been following USS Texas recent dry docking in Galveston? Yes, I have. Um, given how much she seems to have suffered since her last birthing, um, hypothetically, what would you do to maximally preserve dash present her as a museum ship, assuming that money and civic will are unlimited? Well, a lot of the interior and above bulk of the exterior work, you know, that's down to Battleship Texas Foundation. I am absolutely 100% positive they're doing the best job that they can and you know for all the calls I've seen occasionally online that you, know, you should return her to her World War One configuration with cage masts it might be nice but on the other hand Texas has actually arguably more of a combat history in World War Two than she does in World War One and that's the configuration she's in at the moment so I think she should probably stay that way um, to be honest. Now the main thing that I would do to preserve her actually is in relation to what you can see on screen at the moment. This is something that my engineer brain came up with, um, I think, earlier this year, maybe last year, when I was thinking about preserving ships. And you might recognize these as hydrogel beads, gelets, pellet, water pellets, orbeez, apparently they're called in the States. Uh, basically, they're little hydrogel seeds which then absorb water and swell up into these things. Now, what's this got to do with ship preservation? Well, they're 99.9% .9 water, so effectively they have the same density as water. So I would then advocate using them along with a coffer dam system, kind of like what they've done to USS North Carolina and I believe USS Alabama. So you build a secure coffer dam around the ship, um, which could also potentially then... Uh, I, I would probably build a gate in or a removable section in so that you can take the ship off to dry dock when needed. Now, one of the advantages of coffer damming the ship off is that the water then within is now static, which um, part of the whole thing with rust is that any given amount of water can only do so much oxidation 
and continued flow of water means there's constantly freshly oxygenated water coming through, which means the rust can continue apace, plus you get abrasion and so forth. So putting a coffer dam around the ship reduces the abrasion due to flow, um, for the most part, and because the water is a lot more still, also to a certain extent reduces um, rust as the water in the vicinity of the ship will be slightly more deoxygenated, although the water is still going to circulate with temperature differentials and such. And that's where the Orbeez come in, because as you can see, they lock the water into a very static position. And relatively speaking, they are cheap. Um, and if they start to dry out, you just put water on them or it rains and they reabsorb water. So given, that, as I said, that they're the same density near enough as makes no difference as water, I would cough a dam uh, a ship off and then fill the water with these hydrogel seeds and they grow into these little pellets at which point because it's the same density the ship is receiving the same amount of support as it would be sitting in the water but now all the water is absolutely locked in static probably put a cover maybe a transparent perspective cover or something over it similar to what they've done for display purposes on ss great britain and now you might get a little bit of rust from the orbies or whatever you want to call them that are in direct contact with the hull but once if you like in very crude terms once those have done their bit of rust they can't do any more so it can't spread i mean theoretically by osmosis and so forth it would spread very very the water would spread very slightly and very slowly but it would colossally arrest the process of rusting at least in theory um i am going to at some point get my hold of some plates of steel identical steel and stick them in a turbid water environment a still water environment and an orbeez environment and see how long it takes each of them to rust badly but that's going to be a project several months long for obvious reasons um so we'll see how that goes and see if my theory holds any weight but if it does that would be my a proposal for preserving well any museum ship really uh, that's worried about hull rust the judge 2017 asks did queen elizabeth try and save hms vanguard from the scrappers given that she was on the ship for a royal cruise post-war it would seem she had a close personal connection to the ship well we will never know because if the queen did make any representations in that regard uh, they would have been in private and they'll still be sealed for a long time to come uh, but given uh, the late queen's track record um i doubt she would have tried to press the government on such defense related matters yes she had taken a cruise aboard vanguard as a royal yacht but as a royal yacht vanguard had been replaced by britannia uh, which is now a museum ship in edinburgh incidentally if you want to go and visit it so in terms of retaining Vanguard as a royal yacht, well, that wasn't necessary anymore. If anyone in the royal family was going to make representations to try and save Vanguard, I think it probably would have been uh, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, uh, since he was a uh, career naval officer and obviously would have some somewhat strong feelings on the matter. Personally, um, I think retaining Vanguard probably would have been the better option given that the justification the government gave at the end of the 1950s to scrap her was that she was no longer required and obsolete when the studies that they'd done had looked at basically what do we need to retain to deter and deal with soviet sverdlov glass cruisers and the conclusion was that cost and wise and manpower wise you could either retain a couple of towns, which includes HMS Belfast, um, or you could retain Vanguard, but they didn't want to do both. And they decided to retain a couple of towns on the basis that they could be in two places at once and Vanguard could only be in one place at once, which sounds fair enough on the surface, except that, well, the Belfast and Sheffield, well, they also had Gambia around as well, but you know, any town or town class derivative was equally as obsolete if not actually more obsolete than vanguard given that the town class and crown colony class had their 
origins in the mid-1930s, whereas Vanguard was a ship of the late 1930s-early 1940s. And with the best will in the world, much as I love Belfast, sure, she could take a Sverdlov. Could she take two or three Sverdlovs? Um, I'm going to go no. And, well, let's just say the Soviets had more than two or three Sverdlovs around. Whereas, could two or three Sverdlovs take Vanguard? Um, my money's on the battleship at that point, especially if she'd had a proper overhaul, a aka like the one they gave to Belfast in the 50s. So, yeah, I, I think the government's grounds for scrapping Vanguard and keeping the towns are a bit speculous, in my opinion. Admittedly, it would have lost us Belfast to the scrappers, but maybe Vanguard would be sitting in the London pool instead, which would have been interesting. John McCarthy asks, I've always been curious about the spherical structures on large German warships like Bismarck. I think these are rangefinders for the directors. Why did they have that shape? So there are usually two kinds of hemispherical or globular items that are pointed to on German warships. Uh, one of them you can see in this picture of Bismarck just the port side of the main superstructure behind the bridge, which is because we're looking at the ship from the front. It's actually on the slightly to the right from our perspective. Now, this is something you'll see repeated on lots of German warships. This is a four meter range finder, an SL8 type, which is used for the fire control of the 105 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. That's why it's so high. Um, you can see it's on a fairly long cylinder and then obviously can rotate to sea aircraft for or aft of the ship, as well as on the broadside. Now, this particular range where you can see the little ears, if you like, of the actual viewfinders sticking out. The reason it's domed, pretty much design choice. I mean, to be fair, it's a relatively sensible design choice, given that it means that as people are standing inside and maneuvering the thing around, they've got a little bit more elbow room at elbow height. So it's a perfectly sane design, relatively aerodynamic. It's not going to have water pooling on it. It's just a neat little thing. The other thing that you might see on some German warships, uh, as, whereas this is obviously a very globular thing, is something that is much more of a hemispherical, you know, classic dome thing. And when you look at it in close detail, it might even look ribbed. And that is because it's a temporary cover, much like the covers that you might see for babies on old school kids' prams and so forth, except obviously doing a full 180 in this case, uh, and that's for searchlights, uh, because obviously they're fairly delicate. You want to keep them nice and dry and less and until you use them, so you just pop them over and it keeps it dry, pop it, and then like a retractable roof, you pop it open and you can use the searchlight. And actually, that that element of technology is common across a lot of ships. So if you see, for example, pictures of various US battleships and aircraft carriers going into reserve, they have these little domes on them um, which sprout up all of a sudden. They're basically the same thing, weather coverings. And if you happen to go on HMS Belfast, you can see a variety of them, some of them intact or restored and some of them somewhat decayed which were used to cover the delicate parts of the radar various radars um, to keep them dry while they were doing their job michael imbezi asks just how bad was the maintenance on Arkhangelsk, and how would it have affected her ability to do proper damage control after something like a torpedo hit i.e this is royal sovereign after she's loaned to the soviets um Yes, it would have affected her ability to do proper damage control. In fact, I doubt she would have been able to do any damage control, to be perfectly honest. It's a wonder she actually made it back to the UK. If you read the Intel reports that went over Royal Sovereign once she got back, bear in mind, Royal Sovereign had had a full refit, as much as could be done, in the US, and then was immediately put in reserve and then transferred to the Soviet Union. So she was in about as a good state as she was ever going to be, given how old she was. When she got back, you have ob the obvious one everyone knows about. The main gun turrets had fused themselves in place and weren't ever going to rotate again because the bearings hadn't been greased and the sheer weight of the turrets had then bonded everything into place. Um, but also, the list of problems associated with her 
included, but were not limited to, the fact that almost all of the radios and all the radar had vanished or had substantially vanished, as they'd all been nicked for study and replication, presumably, by the Soviets. Most of the plumbing was completely broken because it had been allowed to freeze because the ship had been kept in, uh, fairly chill and at low power up north. And obviously, once the plumbing was broken, no one had bothered to try and fix it. Um, a lot of the gun, other guns were completely non-functional because, again, they had been so little used, they were either frozen in place and or they'd been left with ammunition in them and the ammunition was now bonded in place. So, yeah, the the engines weren't giving anywhere like the power that they should have been. So had she somehow been hit... I mean, uh, to be fair, this is at the end of her span of career with the Soviet Navy. If she'd been hit a couple of months in, um, when she in, after she'd been initially been transferred, when the war was still going on, they're probably, well, there would have been the equipment probably still functional to do decent damage control. Whether or not anyone on board actually knew much about how to use it is another matter. But certainly by the end, if there'd been some arbitrary random torpedoing of her in the late 1940s, I sincerely doubt much, if anything, actually was still functioning on that in ship in terms of damage control. I mean, the bridge took one look at her and went right off to the scrapyard and, um, you know, poke it away with sticks because... The rat infestation is too much. If you ever want to make a World War II US Navy historian cry, just ask them what happened to Milwaukee, which was a US Omaha-class cruiser that had similar treatment, quote-unquote, at the hands of the Soviet Navy. Rebel Skvirl asks, How did radio-controlled target ships actually work in the early 20th century? That is... How was the steering gear and propulsion units modified so that the ship could be controlled remotely? So different ships had different levels of sophistication in their conversion to remote control targets. It also depended to a certain extent on what you intended to do with the target. So if, for example, like at the end of its career, the ex-USS Iowa BB-4 was intended to be sunk, so you couldn't have anybody on there, obviously. But during earlier tests, she wasn't intended to be sunk. She was intended to be reused. And here we can see HMS Agamemnon, the previ previously a Lord Nelson class pre-dreadnought, also converted to a target ship, although in her case never intended to be sunk during an exercise. So the sheer size of battleships meant that the rather large and clunky nature of radio technology at the time didn't really matter all that much so they hooked up some very basic radio remote controls which then drove motors which were attached to the ship's steering so you could steer the ship by remote control and they were also attached in the case of Iowa at least to oil burners so you could and uh, steam throttles so you could vary the speed of the ship Iowa was actually converted to oil burning specifically for that purpose so pretty much like most standard remote control objects you might be used to would be they boats or cars or tanks or whatever you essentially had a left right forward back throttle throttle system and then you would drive it around and things would try and shoot at it or vomit and you would either examine the damage later on or watch it keel over and sink depending on your choice now if you intended to get the ship back then there would be a skeleton crew aboard who would operate the ship as it headed into the tests, and then once it came out of the tests as well, and also do some limited damage control. Now, again, depending on what kind of tests you were doing, these men could either just hide out deep down below in the depths of the ship, if you were testing, let's say, six-inch gunfire effects on the upper superstructure or something, or practice bombs on the upper deck, but if you were lobbing anything a bit more substantial at it, some target ships would actually have a small core area of the ship significantly heavily up armoured. Because obviously the ship, as you can see in the case of Agamemnon and in the case of Iowa, they've taken off the guns and everything, so it's going to be riding higher in the water anyway. So it can stand the weight of having basically an extra armoured citadel built in where the crew could go shelter while the gunfire was going on, and then if anything untoward did happen, hopefully it would protect the crew from that. And then they could pop up and sort things out afterwards. 
So there's a whole gamut from effectively skeleton crewed ships where everyone took shelter and there's basic levels of control all the way up to uh, USS Iowa in its last stages, which was basically a fully unmanned, fully radio controlled vessel that ran around being shot at. Meatward asks, in a recent video from the Kings in General channel, they stated that the British considered sending the Royal Navy to block the Suez Canal to prevent the Regia Marina from reinforcing and resupplying troops for the invasion of Ethiopia, but ultimately decided against it so as not to drive Mussolini into an alliance with Hitler. Well, that worked out well, didn't it? Um, if the Royal Navy and Regia Marina had come to blows at the Suez, what would it have looked like? Well, let's just say I wouldn't want to be an Italian sailor on that day. Bearing in mind that if you just look at capital ships, well, in terms of carriers, Italy has no carriers. <laughs> the Mediterranean fleet, on the other hand, depending on where, when you're looking through 1935 through 37, has anywhere between one and three. If you look at battleships, well, the situation, if you're Italian, is that we basically have no battleships either. Uh, Littorios are not complete. The Conte de Cavours are still being modernised. So you basically have the Dorias, and in 1937 you don't even have them because they've just gone in to uh, modernise and the Cavours are just about getting out of it. Um, so at best you've got two old-school Dorias and the Mediterranean fleet fluctuates between five and seven battleships and battle cruisers. Uh, usually they, there's two battle cruisers and three to five battleships, again, depending on the time period. Usually Queen Elizabeth at this, in this latter stage of the 1930s, although obviously um, War Spite is not there because she's gone in for modernization, so you would be looking at the older, um, so Bar and Malaya, etc. ships. Um, so, yeah, at that point, there's not a tremendous amount of heavy cruisers. In fact, there's more heavy cruisers in the cruiser squadron assigned to Alexandria than there is in the entire Italian fleet at the time. Um, and, yeah, the list kind of just goes on at that point. So, if the Mediterranean fleet had just sat there at the entrance of the Suez Canal and said, come fight us, the Italians would have had to resort to some asymmetrical warfare in order to level the balance because the combined strength of the Regia Marina in 1935 through 37 is not enough to take on the Mediterranean fleet in a straight up fight and win let alone you know if tensions escalate and the Royal Navy starts calling in reinforcements from elsewhere. Fletcher Fletcher's Fletching, Fletcher, Fletcher, Fletching, Fetcher, Fetching, Fletcher's, Fletcher, Fletcher, Fletchlings, <laughs> asks, are there any notable or known Age of Sail ships which are now holding up the roof to someone's parlour, and are any visitable by the public? It's very difficult to say with any degree of certainty. We know that timbers from HMS Namur were used in part of um, Chatham Dockyard, so you can go and see those. But not every single one, but a good chunk of the various stories that go around of, well, this house was built out of ship timbers, etc., are very difficult to prove. Um, a lot of the time it's a ship there's not a kind of which ship and when um and sometimes when they are attributed to specific ships it's incredibly difficult if not impossible to prove it and in some cases there's directly contradictory evidence thereof so i outside of somewhere like chatham dockyard i would be very hesitant of putting my neck out and saying this specific building is held up by timbers from this specific ship um with that said, there's probably a significant number of buildings out there, at least pr uh, 17th century and earlier, that have some element of ship timber in them, although you would probably find that you'd be surprised that most of the timbers are probably actually short ones, not the massive keels and um, ribs of decommissioned ships, because one, by the time ships were sold for breaking, usually those parts had significantly rotted out and if they hadn't the navy would have first dibs on them for reuse in other large ships or their own structures so it would usually be this usually i stress usually be the smaller parts that would end up 
going into houses and so forth. Although it's not unheard of for a major ship's timber to make its way to a house um, on occasion, usually a merchant ship more than anything else. But um, to cite one source from a few years ago, uh, as to you know why I'm saying this last part, in the 18th century, it was the custom in the shipbuilding trade inside and outside the yard to permit workmen to carry home quantities of waste wood known as chips. The term became purely nominal, and the chips became longer and the bundles larger each day. Eventually, the maximum length of the chips was limited to three feet, and this led to doors, furniture and fittings in the houses of the workers suddenly assuming dimensions of this order. George Dicker believes that in the guise of chips, enough wood was removed from Plymouth Yard in a month to build a sloop of war. This was bad enough, but first-class timber was also ruthlessly cut up to provide the chips, and in the centre of many of the bundles were often secreted other items, such as copper bolts. In desperation, the privilege was stopped in 1803, and a monetary allowance was made in lieu. Labourers would receive an additional three pence a day, sawyers four pence a day, and shipwrights six pence. So yeah, the single most likely element of ship timber that's probably in a house that old is probably the door lintels. And uh, you won't know where they came from, <laughs> other than maybe from a dockyard. DM Phoenix asks, How was naval espionage conducted between British, German and other naval powers during the late 19th and early 20th centuries? Spy and recon technology we take for granted today, such as signals, intel, aerial recon and photography, were all in their infancy in this period, which meant more hands-on or social engineering aspects of spycraft were involved. And what kind of naval data was most sought after by opposing navies? This does feel like an eerily familiar question, but regardless, um, in the late 19th century, you just showed up. Um, you, know, you can't just rock up as a foreigner and say, hello, I would like to inspect your latest battleship, please. But if you had the appropriate credentials, you could show up to a dockyard and they would quite happily show you around. If you were on a naval vessel, you could show up to a dockyard on, or the port associated with dockyard on a courtesy visit, and assuming that there were vaguely cordial relations between your two countries, you might be shown around the dockyard um, at, under the supervision of, obviously, an officer or two as part of a courtesy, so you could, you know, take in things by eye, make notes, ask questions, etc, etc. As you transition into the 20th century, things become a lot more closed shop, but you can still get a fair bit of information out, out of dockyards, um, even if not so much in wartime, uh, partly by basic human intel. You just ask, dash, pay people who work there. Um, also, you um, a lot of stuff, although the dockyards themselves had been closed up, a lot of other stuff was a very, very public. So, you know, you if you were, say, the British trying to spy on the Germans, the Germans might not let you into the heart of their dockyard anymore, but if you wanted to know what their next battleship was going to be armed with, then you could much more easily get a civilian agent into Krupp or just quietly look at the announcements that Krupp made, and, well, if Krupp has magically received an order for a bunch of 11-inch guns, then it's fairly certain that the next generation of German battleship is going to be armed with 11-inch guns. This is one of the reasons why the British resorted to what to us seemed to be some very basic uh, deception tactics in calling the 13.5-inch a 12-inch 50 experimental, and the 15-inch was the 13.5-inch experimental. Because as long as you refer to that in official correspondence, then uh, someone who was just reading papers which were otherwise publicly available wouldn't necessarily twig that the gun calibre had been increased. You could, of course, try and infiltrate an agent into the yards themselves to learn a bit more detail, but this had two issues. One was that you could potentially get a German agent into a British yard, or a British agent into a German yard, or a British or a German agent into an American yard, or vice versa, because you could roughly fit in and everyone could be taught to speak the relevant language, and the same for you know, French, Italian, etc. You could usually find someone who'd, who'd be able to, to fit in. However, the problem is, of course, you also have the Japanese, and with the best will in the world, there isn't really anyone in Britain who is going to look Japanese enough who isn't actually of Japanese descent. 
And, well, as you can tell from 1930s USA, there were unfortunate question, questions being asked about loyalty of people purely because they happened to have a different descent to the majority of the population. So trusting them to go on an espionage mission against their quote-unquote country of origin, maybe not such a great bet. But then you also had, bear in mind, up until World War I, foreign warships being built by private concerns for other powers. So, you know, those specs were known. And in addition to all of that, people had this weird habit of, you know, we're going to be hyper secretive in, you know, 1910, 1912, etc., about what ship we're building and what it's going to be armed with, only then to publicly tell everybody at the time of the ship's commissioning, which has a certain amount of intel value because it means, because of the uh, build time involved in large ship construction, that your opponents might have committed to building something different. And then you tell them, well, actually, you know, here it is, this is what it actually is, and now your opponent might have a class of ships that are fairly useless compared to yours. Um, that's kind of what happened with the Invincible and Blucher. You know, the Germans thought that the Invincible was going to be Minotaur except all 9.2-inch guns. They built Blucher to counter. Everybody thought this was great, and then Invincible showed up with 12-inch guns, and the Germans were going kind of like, ah, well, this is a problem. Oh, well, off to build von der Tan. Some random non asks, what are your most overrated battles and or ships and or battleships? Battles are somewhat more difficult to quantify because most, and I stress most, battles are fought for a reason and most major battles are very definitely fought for reasons. The problem with battles is that sometimes, yes, they can become overrated but usually not for reasons surrounding the battles themselves, usually more for people appending larger geostrategic reasons or ignoring other just as significant battles. Um, so a battle can still be very significant, but be ov also be overrated, whereas ships can just be flat out overrated. So two easy examples to pick would be Midway and Trafalgar. They are both very important battles, but they can be overrated in as much as people can sometimes attribute the incorrect things to them. So, for example, Trafalgar is very often cited as the battle that saved England from invasion, or the United Kingdom, or Britain, depending on how accurate you want to be, because at this point the Act of Union has gone through. Nonetheless... Trafalgar is a hugely important battle. Trafalgar ushers in the sort of hundred year Pax Britannica. It establishes the Royal Navy as the premier navy in the world. You know, all these things that are accurate. The one thing Trafalgar doesn't do is protect England from invasion. Uh, and I'm using that in the geographic sense, as in where Napoleon was planning to land. Because Napoleon already left. His army of England had already broken up and headed east for, well, the Russian campaign. We all know how well that went for him. Well, there was Austerlitz in the in between, but um, yeah, that overall not necessarily a winning move. But the, the risk of invasion to the British coast in 1805 was already gone. So Trafalgar was many things, but an invasion stopper it wasn't. Unless you want to argue that maybe by ensuring the dominance of the British fleet, it stopped further attempts in 1806, 7, 8, etc., etc. But Napoleon had other things to be doing in those years, to be perfectly frank. Um, and likewise, Midway. So sometimes you see this narrative of, you know, oh, the US was on the ropes, then Midway, and then glorious victories thereafter, and everything was inevitable. And it's kind of like, well, it is a very significant battle. It results in the loss of an awful lot of Japanese carriers, and it does, you know, break the Japanese advance. This is true to a limit, certain degree, but it wasn't all bad before. You did have Coral Sea, which, okay, overall in terms of losses, Lexington stung a little bit, but... You know, the Japanese withdrew from the field of battle. They didn't achieve their strategic objective. So Coral Sea was a win, and that came before Midway. 
and there were plenty of battles at, during the Guadalcanal campaign which were a loss, which came after Midway. And in terms of stages of development, you know, to say, oh, Midway's the turning point, and from that point on, you know, America, America, la, 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 um, is, well, A, inaccurate because of the Guadalcanal campaign, as I just said, but also in terms of air carrier warfare. Granted, American damage control and some of the doctrine was better than it had been at Coral Sea, but there were still very significant gaps in American carrier doctrine and policy in the aftermath of Midway, which they recognised. You know, they reported on, they said, this is what we can do better. They worked on it, and you see a very different U.S. carrier arm fighting the Guadalcanal campaign, Santa Cruz and Eastern Solomons, and then they go away and they work on it again, and so on and so forth. So the kind of Battle of the Philippine Sea level U.S. Navy, in terms of its carrier ops, is a very, very, very different beast to the one that had just finished fighting Midway. There's a huge swathe of development in between. So whilst Midway is certainly a key battle and a very important battle, it, like Trafalgar, sometimes gets inaccurate things appended to it. And as you might have guessed from the picture, I, if I had to pick one single ship in all of history that's been massively overrated, Bismarck would be it. People would have you believe that Bismarck was an invincible doom ship that could defeat anything and everything on the high seas. You see people legitimately asking a que questions like, could Bismarck defeat a Yamato class? And then defending an answer of yes. Could Bismarck defeat an Iowa class? And defending an answer of yes. Now, yes, in theory, a Bismarck class could beat an Iowa. In theory, a Bismarck class could beat a Yamato, I suppose, if you catapulted it at sufficient velocity um but these are very much outliers you know nine times out of ten or more an iowa or a yamato is going to take a bismarck and stomp it into the ground and grind it into mush beneath its heel and scrape the remaining detritus down a drain you know, bismarck is not that good um nor is she an invincible doom ship against everything else that gets thrown at her as you may have guessed from some of the comments that i was responding to in um when i did the james cameron video on bismarck as i've said now as i've said before bismarck is not strictly speaking a bad ship a bad ship would be a ship that is exceptionally vulnerable to exploding or sinking a bad ship would be a ship that can't really hurt its opponents Bismarck could hurt its opponents, and Bismarck had a reasonable degree of durability, even if not in terms of co remaining combat effective, not necessarily as durable as a lot of others. And bear in mind, there is a big difference between remaining combat effective in terms of can you fight back and remain and durability in terms of are you still afloat? These are two very, very different things. Um... But as I've said before, Bismarck is, broadly speaking, comparable to other Treaty-era battleships. But she's six, seven thousand tons heavier than most Treaty-era battleships. So, yeah, she's an inefficient design that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with most of the latest and greatest that are coming off the production lines at the time that she is commissioned... But she's on a par with, not massively superior to those ships. And certain uh, certain of the treaty battleships, I would give advantages over Bismarck. In some cases, significant advantages. And even when it comes to the staying afloat department, well, as I like to point out to people, Kirishima stayed afloat longer than Bismarck between the opening of the respective engagements and the ships slipping beneath the water. So, um... Staying above the water for a long period was not the strength of the Bismarck that you might otherwise think. In fact, only three battleships sank faster. Two of which were the uh, Fusos <laughs> at the Battle of Surigao Strait. And the other one was Prince of Wales by three minutes. Donovan asks, I realise the improbability of this question, but how would a pirate manage to acquire a ship of the line, say a fourth rate or a lower end third rate? And how would the navies of the world react to this menace to the merchant's pocketbook? Well, it's, as you say, incredibly unlikely that this would ever happen. 
Um, but if we're talking, let's say a a sixty gunner, sixty to seventy gunner, maybe up to a seventy four. How would a pirate manage to actually acquire one? Basically, it would be incredibly circumstantial. So perhaps there was a battle in the area and one of one ship of the line was taken as a prize. It was put under tow. Then a big storm came up. The tow lines parted. Um, the prize crew and any survivors skedaddled, thinking the ship's going to sink in boats, got back to their um main craft the craft that done the capturing it sails off and everything's thought to be lost and then maybe a day or two later the pirate ship comes along and finds a waterlogged badly shot up third rate sitting in the water potentially that would be a way they get hold of it um i think probably that's really it. realistically outside of like massive disease suddenly breaking out and killing the crew of an otherwise functional ship of the line that's probably about the only way you're going to find someone getting their their hands on one there are a few other scenarios maybe but they're actually even more unlikely maybe like something going aground being abandoned and yet somehow not being so badly damaged that by the time a pirate ship turns up and doesn't go aground somehow they're able to tow it off but in any case how would the merch how would the various navies of the world react to a pirate vessel suddenly showing up with a let's say a 64 gunner um realistically there's well there's two things from a purely practical standpoint their reaction should be to sit back and laugh their heads off because there is no way shape or form this thing is ever going to be disguised as anything other than a warship so all stealth for a pirate has gone completely out the window they're going to have find it near as much as makes no difference impossible to re-ammunition the ship and well good luck finding six to eight hundred pirates who are all going to get along to man the thing properly um you're basically either going to be running it on a skeleton crew in which case it's a big clumsy unstealthy you know road flare of a thing that everyone's just going to steer clear of and they can't really do much to you anyway or everyone's going to be dead from internal dissent um, and butchery in fairly short order. Although, on the more practical side of things, just in case there's a magical several hundred strong community of pirates who will get on well and can find somewhere to berth the thing in between and have magical sources of ammunition, the the navies would probably dispatch some hunting groups made up of you know a squadron of third rate, so two or three. And if you outlier frigates, they'd fairly quickly track it down and retake it. And in fact, there is one other good reason to retake it. If it's a third rate, it's worth a lot of prize money. And it'll be flipping easy pickings for a, a, rate, a full, you know, Navy issue third rate with a full crew. Brian Stevens asks, unlike cars, planes and boats, ship speed seems to follow different rules. That is, I'm used to smaller fighter planes being faster, in general, than bigger cargo or passenger planes. Sports and supercars are faster than trucks or lorries, but the fastest ships seem to be the big ones. Carriers are the largest military ships out there, and they seem faster than almost anything else. I'm unaware of the top speed of destroyers, because it never gets talked about these days. Well, it would be classified even if it was. Um, or are ships just different? There's a good solid video from the channel Casual Navigation, uh, which uh, again I've linked in the video description at the timestamp for this question, which goes into this in a little bit more detail. But suffice to say that there is a thing called hull speed, uh, which is the first of two peaks where you have maximal resistance. And that hull speed it is um, you get to your hull speed when the wavelength of your bow wave is such that you have your bow wave peak obviously at the bow and the next peak of the waveform that you've just constructed is at the stern of your ship and you just have the trough dead center in your in the middle of your ship or now if you're traveling slower than that you will have multiple peaks and troughs along the side of your ship and if you're traveling faster than that you'll just have a single peak and trough and maybe a little bit of a rise but because hull speed is proportional to length, 
that by an equation, that means that the longer the ship, the higher the hull speed, i.e. you can get up to a certain, to let's say if you're aiming for 30 knots, if you've got a short ship, small ship, you're going to hit hull speed well before you hit 30 knots. If you've got a very big ship, you know, then th at 30 knots, your hull speed might still be 5, 10, 15 knots further away. So, um, therefore, assuming similar design of hull and similar ratio of power, a larger ship will go faster because it re experiences less resistance at a given speed within the realms of reasonable speeds. The other thing, um, which isn't mentioned so much in the casual navigation video, is also that wonderful friend of ours, the square cube law. Because as a ship's size increases, obviously the length increases linearly, the surface area increases by a square, and the internal volume increases by a cube, which means that the surface area to internal volume ratio Gut starts to go down for larger ships, and that, and also with much larger volume, therefore you can put an awful lot more power plant relative to the surface area in your ship, which is another thing that's important because it's the surface area of your ship that is under the water that dictates how much resistance you're going to be experiencing. And if you can only put a certain amount of for the sake of argument, power per square meter of wetted area down, you can only get up to a certain speed and a larger ship, more volume, more power plant, in theory available if you wish to install it. Therefore, you will be have basic it's basically the power to weight ratio or power or wing loading ratio equivalent um, for performance for a ship as it would be for a plane or a car or etc etc they're, they're not exactly the same but they follow broadly similar principles so those are the general twofold reasons as to why um, ships large ships tend to be capable of going faster than smaller vessels um, also incidentally you know the whole thing with hull speed, hump speed, general dy uh, hydrodynamics, etc., as you'll see in the video and as you can see here, yes, there are bow waves and there are troughs and there are crests along the side of a ship, even if it gets up all the way up to its hull speed. So for those wonderful people out there who f were flat out denying that there could be any trough along the side of a ship, um, like, say, Hood, uh, when she's travelling at speed... I'm sorry, but physics and uh, general, you know, ship navigation and handling education says you're wrong. Um, <laughs> just had to get that one in there. Megascro asks, the minutiae of naval training, the small things that were part of training that you would really l like to, to, but often wouldn't, think of, such as how to properly walk upstairs, slide downstairs, go through a submarine hatch, and other stuff that I've seen shown in various videos, such as how tricky it can be to get in and out of a hammock. What are these little yet important things? Well, you've covered a lot of them, but you know, other minutia will be, you know, which direction do you go on a ship? Um, you know, depending on the Navy, there could be different regulations. Do you, uh, uh, do you go, do you follow a one-way system all the time? Do you only do it at when the ship's in action if so and either way which way is that one-way system um you know what's what's the best place to try and get on the ship on a given ship when there's a storm if you don't like the the movement of the ship what's the best place to be on the ship if you do like the movement uh, of a ship you know how do you how do you sling a hammock not just getting in and out of one but for the period when they were still around how do you sling one in the first place to ensure the greatest comfort and that you don't end up penduling all over the place um what are the shortcuts if any um all this kind of stuff there's lots of little important details um you know what's the best clothing to wear in certain weathers because if you just go arbitrarily by wind or arbitrarily by temperature, you could end up being too cold or too warm, which would be bad. Um, in some cases, depending on your track record, what's the best way to avoid the gaze of officers? And now the following is something that I've heard from a few different sailors, but I have heard a few other people say different. So um, take this one as you will. 
um, if you were a sailor or are a sailor in the Navy and you have uh, input, I would greatly appreciate hearing from you as well. And uh, this is relates to the ladders on a ship. Um, now, uh, Ryan over at Battleship New Jersey it has done a long video, relatively long video about ladders. Um, and obviously he has a battleship to play with. So again, link in the video description at the timestamp of this question. But the way that I was told things is that basically if you are in port, then uh, the ship is stationary, like pretty much all museum ships are. Then the safest way to go down a ladder is to, or go up a ladder for that matter, is to do it face first, face forward, not face first, <laughs> face forward. So you are looking at the rungs or the steps or whatever, um, for pretty much all the reasons that Ryan explains in his video, but it's basically your foot's on the ladder, it's stable, um, it's the most stable position, and if you fall, you should be able to catch yourself relatively easily. However, in the event that you are at sea and the ship is pitching and rolling, apparently the best way is to go down forwards, because if you are going up and down a ladder, obviously at any given point you are likely to have at least one foot off of a rung, and if the ship pitches or rolls violently and you are relatively loosely supporting yourself on your arms on um, as well as climbing, which is what you will tend to do when you are facing a ladder, then if the ship pitches or rolls such that it you end up with gravity pulling you towards the ladder, you may not get your arms locked before you smash your face into either the ladder or the boots of the person above you. And likewise, if the ship pitches or rolls in such a way that you are now being pulled away from the ladder, you very well may not be able to um, tense your grip on the rungs, rails or chains or whatever before you end up being flung backwards off the ladder. Whereas the kind of Naruto run arms back uh, or arms vertical straight down facing forward that you see people going down ladders in a lot of wartime films and so forth apart from being faster because you are leaning slightly away from the ladder in the first place your arms are a lot more locked in a lot more tensed so if the ship rolls in such a way that you're being pulled even further forward away from the ladder you're already gripping on a fair bit because you were already pitching forward a bit anyway which means you're not likely to be flung forward off of off of the ladder and you know if your feet go from under you, you just slide down it which you may have been doing anyway um and likewise if it pitch if you're pitched backwards again because your arms are in a greater degree of tension you are far more likely to be able to readily support yourself you're if you're going really fast down you're probably pitching forward slightly anyway so you only come back probably to roughly vertical as it stands regardless and in the event that you do despite all of that somehow ending pitching backwards into the ladder a it's going to be slowed down because again ten of the tension in your arms even if you're not completely able to fight it and b you're going to land with most of your back etc on the ladder okay granted you might bash the back of your head if you're really unlucky but you will probably come off slightly better than smashing face first into the ladder. Now, that makes sense to me from an engineering perspective, and I say this was shared with me by a few different sailors over or ex-sailors over the years, but I look forward to seeing your comments below what how you think uh, ladders should be used whilst you're in active, actively working at sea. Certainly when I've been on the, the very few cruises in my life that I've been on on various ships, it seems to have worked for me quite well. Jonathan Welch asks, what happened to damaged aircraft that landed on carriers? Were they simply shoved overboard or were they repaired or scavenged for useful parts? It depends very much on the nature of the damage. So, um, well, here's a landing that didn't go quite as well as it could have done. But as you can see, whilst the propellers themselves are a little bit bent, it's this particular Sea Fury is probably actually perfectly fine other than that. Now, granted, in peacetime, you would probably want to do some checks on the propeller shaft to make sure that hasn't been knocked offline, etc., etc. But broadly speaking, especially if this was wartime, it would be a case of, well, slap a new propeller on the thing, give it a quick alignment check, and get it back in the skies. 
Uh, conversely, if this had gone a little bit worse and it had gone over and flopped onto its back, then there would be more questions because at that point probably the tail's damaged, the propellers are damaged, um, cockpit might be cracked, fuselage oh, stressed in ways it hadn't been supposed to be, etc., etc. So that would need more looking at. And you know the same thing with gunfire damage. If you've got a few holes in the uh, leading edge of your wing on the outer portion well you're probably just going to fix that up quite easily um, if you've got a bunch of holes smashed through the engine and the lower part of the pilot's ca cockpit section maybe that's a bit more of a maintenance job um, if you know half a wing is missing one one tail a plane is mostly gone and the rest of the aircraft looks like a Swiss cheese, well, sorry, that's going to be over the side because it's just no point. So, yeah, it basically comes down to what is the level of damage. If, if it's a write-off immediately, which, I mean, it would take a fairly serious amount of damage, but it, it's possible that a plane in write-offable condition could be brought back by a pilot, then, yeah, over the edge it goes, and so long, farewell, if you does and good night. If it's somewhat damaged then it may be taken it well, would be taken below and then they'd make an evaluation if it's a case of we have this spare or a couple of spares and a few patches and it's good to go then it'll be repaired and put back into service if it's a case of let's say for example to, to halfway house the previous example a pilot manages to land his aircraft, but you know half his starboard wing is gone. He's been holding the whole thing over the entire way home, um, and then upon landing, one of his landing gear collapses, punches up through the other wing. The propeller gets sheared off, and there's a massive long scrape and rent down the bottom of the fuselage. That thing's never going to fly again. But you know, take off the tail plane um, and the rudder, take out the cockpit equipment the engine, some of the guns, all of those might very well be salvageable and usable, and then chuck the remains over the edge. Sky asks, how were battleship guns, or in fact naval guns in general, fired? Trigger, button, etc.? It depends usually on the era, um, but if we're talking about Dreadnought-era battleship guns, or that at least that kind of thing, very early on in that period you would have a basically a drawstring um, it's not quite a drawstring but basically a cord or chain that you would pull that could manually fire the gun oh well, good luck with that <laughs> later as the guns get more powerful etc later on but electrical firing for the dreadnought period was pretty much the standard at which point you could fire the guns with whatever form of electrical contact circuit closer you liked um, some ships used buttons nice big you know, push the red button, um, and other ships used a trigger system. So, for example, this is the firing uh, section or in within the fire control room on USS Massachusetts, but this is similar across basically all of the US fast battleships and some of the smaller ships as well. And these uh, handles that you can see are how the central director can fire the guns. So you've got the left hand one there which is to signal that a salvo is about to be fired and the the middle one which has the little raised nodules on it you pull that one and it, it's literally a pistol grip with a trigger you pull that and the guns go off um, back up in the turrets if you're firing under local control again it could be a pistol grip it, with a trigger it could be a button it could be whatever your navy in question happens to think is the most appropriate for your duty. Crack Muppet asks, a co-worker of mine tells me he served briefly on the gearing class destroyer USS Meredith in the 70s before she was sold to the Turkish Navy. He claims that she suffered from a significant list that the crew were unable to do anything about. Is there any record of this specific circumstance? Additionally, are there any cases of ships, uh, other ships suffering a similar trim or list issue that was either difficult or unable to be corrected? Now, this being the 1970s US Navy, I don't know if that is specifically recorded somewhere. Um, and I suspect that most operational records of US ships in the 70s are probably still not accessible to people like myself. Could be wrong in that respect. But um, yeah, basically, I 
don't know if there's a record of Meredith herself having a specific list in the late 70s. However, um, there are plenty of cases through history of various ships suffering similar difficult to correct trim or listing issues, usually when they're older. Um, but sometimes, you know, things could be very subtle as well. For example, one of the US frigates, um, the super frigates back in the very beginning of the 19th century, was reputed to be the worst or nearly the worst sailing vessel in the entire Navy until a new captain came in and went, I don't like that trim and redistributed the ballast in the holder and suddenly that ship went to being one of the best sailing ships in the in the navy so that's a trim issue um listing issues are slightly less common because the list is somewhat more noticeable um than a trim which can be a bit subtle but uh it was still an issue so uh, it, ships with trim issues tended to usually find out when they kept burying their nose in the water ships with listing issues it would as they usually be with older ships, either because something, a fuel tank, an anti-roll tank, ironically enough, um, or a bilge, had flooded and either couldn't be pumped out because of some quirk of design of the ship, or it could be pumped out in theory if all the pumps were working, but they're not, and basically a lack of maintenance issue, or just lack of priority issue. You know, if if uh, something is an unused space, then maybe no one notices for a while, or if they do notice, but it's not particularly high priority to fix. The other thing, especially with older ships that have been significantly upgraded, can also be the changes in its metacentric height and other elements of its stability, all to do with what's on the upper works, what has been removed or not removed, what has been added or not been added. And in those cases, you may find that at certain loads you know, ammunition men food fuel etc the ship may be of a certain stability such that it is naturally stable at a given list and attempts to put it back on in, in the position you might otherwise think uh, it should be straight upright may not actually work assuming of course yeah as i said there isn't a leak somewhere further down Bjarki Hill Marson asks, did the Admiral responsible for the Mark VI detonator, Christie, ever have to face any consequences for his blunders? Directly, I'm not aware of any, but indirectly, there certainly seems to have been. So if you look at his immediate predecessor in command of the Southwest Pacific Area Submarines, Admiral Lockwood, um, bearing in mind that the two weren't not exactly massively apart in seniority or overall age. Um, Admiral Lockwood was promoted to Vice Admiral in the middle of the war. He went on to still command the Pacific Fleet submarines during the war and was then after the war made Navy, Naval Inspector General, which is a pretty high-ranking position, uh, and then obviously retired in the late 1940s. Whereas Christie... Uh, was, remained a rear admiral and was held at rear admiral rank um, even if you look at the very slight differences in terms of their seniority he was still rear admiral rank when theoretically if he was going to match Lockwood he should have become vice admiral um, he was relieved of command of the submarine force in the southwest pacific whilst the war was going on and was then shuffled over to various commands that whilst prestigious most people who have been in the navy or know a lot about the navy will understand are kind of dead end roles so you know having been in an active combat command instead of being made inspector general or whatever um, he was sent to command a navy yard and thereafter he was given command of naval forces in outlying areas no major uh, zone commands even to the level of prestige of southwest pacific fleet submarines and would only have, on, only be promoted to Vice Admiral upon retirement, so it was basically a in-name only promotion. Um, and he retired a couple of years after Lockwood in the, the, towards the very end of the 1940s. So he didn't get the same promotion as Lockwood, and uh, he was really in some ways relieved early, and his career was basically treading water from that point on until his retirement whereas Lockwood went about as high as it, he was reason, could reasonably be expected to go before 
he retired. So no direct consequences that I'm aware of, but some consequences to his career do seem to have accrued. Manani Wanderer asks, For the US and Royal Navies, what names have been the most assigned but least launched because it was changed or the ship was cancelled? So I was actually probably going to go with USS Montana, considering how that name has had no luck whatsoever for most of the 20th century, having you know two very large dreadnoughts, ironically enough, both armed with 12 16-inch guns, named after the state and then having them both cancelled. Uh, but I think the winner for the US is probably actually USS United States, <laughs> because there's only actually ever been one of them, the original... Uh, one of the original six frigates, but USS United States was going to be the last of six Lexington class battle cruisers, cancelled. It was also to be an aircraft carrier, uh, the very first supercarrier, most likely, cancelled. And it was also proposed that what we now know as USS Harry S. Truman, CVN-75, was going to be the United States, and that was also cancelled. So, yeah. For for all the fact that people have tr kept trying to have a USS United States, we apparently haven't actually had one and since you know the early part of the 19th century. For the Royal Navy, I think the winner is probably going to be a tie between Polyphemus and Minotaur. Usually, that wouldn't be a contest. It would be looking at one of the battleship names. But uh, Polyphemus and Minotaur were supposed to have been town class cruisers they were supposed to be the first two town class cruisers or more accurately they were supposed to have been the last two leander class which were then turned technically cancelled dash turned into the first two towns except then the first two towns were named southampton and newcastle and the names were kicked down the line uh, they were then briefly proposed as the names of two, the first two town class derivatives which turned out to be the Crown Colonies, so they couldn't use them in those. So they got, got kicked down the line again to uh, another sub-variant. Now that particular sub-variant did eventually get Minotaur built, but it was very quickly renamed HMCS Ontario, and so the Minotaur name came back into circulation. Um, and then they, with Minotaur, if Minotaur was then going to notionally be the name of a rapid six inch auto loading cruiser uh, which is also called Minotaur in World of Warships obviously that didn't happen Polyphemus's name was eventually tagged on to a Centaur class carrier and that didn't happen either so in the course of about a decade give or take a little bit um, Polyphemus and Minotaur had something like half a dozen ships theoretically carrying their names and none of them actually got built Glenn Riccafrente asks, In your opinion, what were the best one-offs of each ship type, cruisers and up, in World War I, the interwar period, and World War II? Well, for World War I, it's actually pretty hard because almost everything was produced in classes, so there aren't that many one-offs to pick from. I mean, in cruisers, well, at least there's not that many good one-offs to pick from. So, yeah, in terms of cruisers, you're almost, not quite, but almost by process of elimination, just left with Blücher. Um, for battle cruisers, well, at that point, you're basically looking at a toss-up between Tiger and Seidlitz, because Deflinger, Lutz, and Hindenburg were all of the same class. And for battleships, well, the Germans didn't build any one-offs. The British didn't build any one-offs for themselves, which then means you're left and contending with just the ones that they acquired from various places, of which Erin, the ex-Ottoman um, halfway house between the King George V and the Iron Dukes was probably the best representative. The US didn't build any one-off battleships. The French didn't. The Russians kind of had a loose collection of related ships. So, yeah, it, it's... In some cases, the World War One stuff is almost self-selecting. Interwar um, gets slightly easier. There were a bunch of one-offs. Obviously, I've said before, I think Algeria is one of, if not the best treaty period cruisers so and she's also one-off so Algeri quite comfortably slots into there um 
battle cruisers hood wins by default because it's the only battle cruiser completed post World War Two in the interwar period, and well. I suppose Dunkirk's in there as well, but I'd take Hood over Dunkirk. Um, battleships, on the other hand, uh, well, if we class Dunkirk as a battlecruiser and Strasbourg as a battleship, then she's a one-off, but the Colorados are a class, the Naga Nagatos are a class, the Nelsons are a class, so the King George V, the Bismarcks, the Littorios, the Richelieus, etc., etc., which kind of basically means for the interwar Strasbourg wins the battleship section again pretty much by default which is slightly amusing to me um and then world war 2 well again there's not a tremendous number of one offs to be perfectly honest um vanguard He's basically the only one-off battleship. Yamato's are a class. Iowa's are a class. South Dakota's are a class. Um, the Torios, etc. Richelieu's will go back a ways. King George V's are a class. So again, World War II, one-off. You basically are left Vanguard winner winner by default. Battle cruisers, no one actually completes any unless you want to open that can of worms, which is the Alaskas again. Um... But even then, the Alas there were at least two of the Alaskas, so you know there, there isn't a one-off battle cruiser, and cruisers again difficult to pick because everyone's building them in batches, even the Japanese. So so yeah, the, it's hard to find a one-off in the World War Two period. About the only place where it's relatively easy to find one-offs for the interwar and World War Two period where there's any kind of level of competition is aircraft carriers. Um, more so in the interwar period. But even then, you know, it, it's still a kind of a default win because you've got, in the interwar period, you've got Ranger and Wasp for the US, which, let's face it, are never going to be winning top-of-the-line prizes anytime soon. The same with Bern, um, or Hosho, or Hermes, or Argus, or Eagle, or Furious. <laughs> um, I think that the, the only two roughly into war fleet... Well, the only three, I should say, are roughly into war fleet carriers that are going to be one-offs as well as having a chance at the top spot are either going to be a Kagi, not Karga because the Kagi is just better. So it's going to be a Kagi, Arc Royal, and Indomitable, and they all represent three very different design styles. So a Kagi is the largest, but she's a converted battle cruiser. Arc Royal is purpose-built aircraft carrier, and follows more of a U.S. World War Two era design style. And then Indomitable is kind of a half illustrious and verging on World War II design, but is a fully armoured carrier. So, yeah, good luck picking out of that lot. <laughs> and then, well, World War II, you've basically got things like Graf Zeppelin, which not quite complete, Taiho, etc., etc., because everything else is being built in batch classes. Daniel Friedman asks, what do you want to try next in your taste of naval history experiments? And what do you least want to try, apart from sauerkraut, since that one's pretty much a given? And what will Mrs. Drack not allow in the house? Ah, oh, yes, the uh, the look of slight concern that uh, appeared mid of, in the middle of that video. Well, you see, I'm a little bit torn, because... Doing 20th century naval rations, I think, is probably not going to be too exciting for anybody because most 20th century naval rations tended to be a very basic variant of what they had on land, spiced up by whatever the local onboard cooks and chef could come up with because they had tin preservation, they had refrigeration, etc., etc., etc. And 
A decent chunk of the 19th century also fits that category, except perhaps with a bit more of the tin stuff. So, you know, what your grandparents or great-grandparents ate, except possibly slightly saltier, probably doesn't make for a fantastic video. You really have to go back to the beginning of the 19th century and the late 18th century, which is obviously the where I picked up the, the last one that we did for the Royal Navy, the, to when you actually start to get something vaguely interesting. And it is actually a relatively narrow window, because if you go back much earlier than that, kind of you know, if you go back past the Tudor period, people aren't really going particularly far so a lot of their stuff is basically going to be fresh food a la whatever they were eating on land which granted they may, might have some interesting variations on it but it, it's not going to have a as much i think of a distinctly nautical theme as the classic age of sale where people were expecting to go long distances and therefore had to think of inventive ways of preserving food in the time prior to refrigeration and canning so I think maybe something like a French or Spanish Navy ration, again from the late 17th, oh sorry, late 18th, early 19th centuries. So kind of the opposite number to what the British were eating. That would probably be um, my, my next one of choice. Unless, of course, people have got specific ideas about what they want me to see to eat in terms of what time period and what national navy. And I'll consider some of those. Um, now, as for what Mrs. Drack won't lie on the house, she generally is pretty OK with most foods. Um, but I think we'd all draw the line at surströming, mostly because we know exactly what that smells like. Um, I may or may not, uh, plausible deniability engaged, have used surströming for purposes that are not particularly food-like but do involve people I don't really like, but that's another matter. Weyland and Chow asks, roughly how much tonnage did the four circulation boilers save in the Richelieu-class battleships? And did any other warships use four circulation boilers? It's not so much raw tonnage saved with the Richelieu's boilers. It's m more space-saving by enabling them to drop a boiler room because they're able to get three boilers breast instead of two. Um, and therefore, the machinery space could be smaller. Therefore, the citadel space could be smaller, thus saving overall, overall weight, or even if the machinery itself was still relatively heavy. And also, it's in terms of horsepower per tonne of machinery, which is the thing. So remember, the Richelieu's had to generate a lot of power in order to get up to their design speed. So if you look at a King, say, let's say a King George V class power plant, the King George V's power plant weighs less than the Richelieu's power plant, but the King George V is only supposed to get to 28 knots, not 32. But when you divide the horsepower generated when it's not under force draft, so the normal maximum horsepower, by the tonnage of machinery, so you get horsepower per tonne of machinery, the King George V's are a about 40 horsepower per tonne. The Richelieu's are pushing closer to 50 horsepower per tonne. So they're getting a lot more per uh, power per tonne of machinery space, per, sort of per tonne of machinery, and the machinery itself is taking up substantially less space. So if the King George V's wanted to get 155,000 shaft horsepower out of uh, a power plant, and they were using the machinery that the British used in the King George V, you'd need a lot more space, which, you know, apart from the weight, is also a huge drag on the ship's design. As far as other warships using forced circulation boilers, this is pumps to circulate the water inside the boilers, not um, pumps and fans used to circulate the air in the boiler in, in the boiler rooms, which is forced draft, which everyone was using. Um, I'm not aware of quite, uh, I'm not aware of any other capital ships of the time period that the channel covers using boilers that use the same kind of methods as the Sural boilers did. Um, obviously, there has to be some way of 
controlling the movement of water and steam through the boilers but the level of control and the volume that the pumps could move in the Sahara boilers were a step beyond anything else. Reichsbeer Minister asks, regarding the aftermath of the Skagerrachschlacht, aka the Battle of Jutland, on a purely naval level, without any politics, what were, or had been, if politics and so on had allowed, the measurements taken to win an engagement of this type or size by either side, if such an engagement would happen again? Now, I'm not exactly sure what the question's asking. The English is a little bit weird. Um, but I think what's being asked is what did the navies involved think they needed in order to win an engagement of this type or size if they were going to fight it again? I think that's what's being asked. If not, I do apologise and please let me know. Um, but on a purely naval level the measures and conditions that the british were looking at in terms of what they thought they needed to win a second jutland basically amounted to they were happy with the size and numerical superiority of the battle fleet because that had proven to be more than enough deterrent to take out the or scare off the germans um what they did recognise was obviously a need for better communications, a need for more night fighting training, although that was something that they couldn't solve immediately, and of course a need, once they realised the shell issue, a need for better shells and fuses. So as far as the battle fleet on battle fleet engagement was concerned, the British were more about you know changing the details rather than the overall strength of their ships the battle cruisers were a slightly different matter the battle cruiser fleet was much reduced and there were serious questions being asked about how exactly that that had happened obviously the explosions hadn't helped but why those explosions had occurred was the main thing under discussion and that led amongst other things to uh, you know well you got you eventually ended up with Renown, Repulse, and Hood, albeit that plans for all for all of those had started before Jutland, but they were definitely needed afterwards to make good the losses. Um, and the questionable addition of Courageous, Glorious, and Not Quite Furious uh, to the whole affair. But obviously the battle cruiser fleet needed a significant overhaul in order for it to be a viable force and to not have consistent explosions all the time so that was the main focus on an organizational level for the british obviously more ships is always better hence the arrival of the sixth battle squadron later on because well if you're going to play unfair you might as well play might as well play really 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 unfair um the germans on a purely naval level well Scheer acknowledged that he could not fight another jutland and expect to survive that one um, especially if the British took on board the lessons that they needed to, which he reckoned they probably would. As far as the Germans were concerned, the only way they were going to win a second Jutland was if what they had tried to pull off with the first one, i.e. a planned U-boat ambush ahead of time, if that somehow could actually be made to work. And they did actually put a fair bit of effort trying to figure out if they could make it work and what had possibly gone wrong beforehand. Um... But in overall terms, whilst the German fleet would venture out to do various operations again, they generally weren't trying to find and fight the Grand Fleet. If they knew the Grand Fleet was at sea, they would generally return home. So the Germans realised, obviously, either you need a massive force leveller in the shape of massive U-boat ambushes, and that takes time to set up, if it's going to work at all. Um, otherwise just don't engage the only other way is to obviously to increase the size of the Kaiserliche Marina and well the big problem with that is that uh, whilst they had Sachsen, Württemberg and the Mackensons under construction they were also a little bit distracted by you know the massive land war in Europe and so they would never actually get any of those constructed. Joel Mullen asks how were the Acacia class used in the Dardanelles, Aegean, Adriatic, and Mediterranean? So the Acacias, which were the first of five flower-type 
sloops, uh, with five subclasses that were built in World War One, which are distinct from the flower class corvettes of World War Two. They were sent out to a variety of places, as mentioned in the question, based in the Mediterranean, some of them, and a good chunk of them also still based at home. Now, whilst they're called sloops, they were also purpose-built as minesweepers, partly, I suspect, in relation to the fact that, you know, converting trawlers with civilian crews to minesweepers hadn't worked particularly well in the Dardanelles in the Gallipoli campaign and so these ships were now navy manned and specially designed to allow them to conduct minesweeping operations uh, as well as the sweeps etc they also had a rather unique feature which was that the bows of the ship had three layers of hull so you could have mines going off nearby and it was very unlikely that you would cause a ship to sink because of damage to the bow from an explosion. So the Acacias, when they were initially deployed, were used in this role as minesweepers. However, given that they're coming into service in the middle of the war, sort of coming into service late 15, 1915, early 1916, they don't remain tied to that service for too long. Although whilst they are operating as minesweepers, they also already start adopting a secondary role as rescue vessels because the mines that they're having to sweep are generally in shipping channels being laid by either German auxiliary mine layers or German submarines which means that they're also in U-boat hunting grounds so if a ship strikes a mine nearby or is attacked by a submarine nearby there turns out relatively often to be an acacia somewhere in the vicinity and so when you look through the histories of the various acacias, even when they're in their minesweeping phase, they, you see them quite often being the first or only ship able to respond to a ship that's in distress. Sometimes chasing off the U-boats and then rescuing the crew, and other times just straight up rescuing the crew and any passengers because the U-boats already gone away. But in light of that, especially as the war moves on, and anti-submarine measures are getting stronger, convoys are coming in, etc. The acacias start to transition away from minesweeping, although they can still do that. And they, in their wartime role towards 1917-1918, they start being used more and more as escort ships. Basically an early anti-sub frigate in many ways being used just without the sonar the same way that the flower class of World War II would be used. But there is this kind of hybrid phase of the convoys where you have the main convoys and you will find acacias occasionally escorting those, but you also have individual vessels, um, especially liners, coming in and acacias are quite often used as single point escorts. So if you've got a specific... Um, ocean liner coming in it's separate from the convoys then quite often an acacia is sent out to meet it and act as sole escort to, as it heads in now ironically enough most of the liners are actually technically slightly faster than the acacias which max out at 17 to 18 knots but even if they're cruising together at say 16 knots that's still substantially quicker than the average convoy is going and so it provides a degree of protection against U-boats purely from the speed. So that seems to be the primary uses of the Acacias in World War I, both in home waters and around the Mediterranean. And they're not used too much around the Dardanelles and Gallipoli, because to be perfectly honest, by the time any significant number of them are both in service commissioned and sent down to the Mediterranean and arrive there, the Gallipoli campaign is basically over and uh, the Adriatic obviously is still relatively hostile because you've got the Austro-Hungarian fleet there so the Acacias kind of go as, uh, roughly usually as far as the Otranto barrage and not really that much further but in the Aegean and the Mediterranean as a whole they are quite useful vessels. Togfather asks what went wrong in the design process for the Lexingtons in their battle cruiser form compared to the Amagis and the G3s? Their displacement is similar to an Amagi but 
considerably less than a G3. They have more engine power than either, but their speed advantage isn't huge, especially compared to the G3. The Lexingtons also have fewer main battery guns, and both their competitors have superior protection, significantly so in the case of the G3. So why did the Lexington stack up so poorly in comparison? Were they just inefficient designs, or is there something else that was taking up the tonnage? So it's a number of small factors that all add up, part of which is just the era in which the design was started. Now, obviously, the Lexington design was considerably modified from the point at which its first general layout was considered, but ultimately there will be holdovers from that, and warship design was advancing at an incredible pace. The Lexingtons of the three are the oldest design, the original design being tendered, and considered in sort of 1915, 1916, the mostly 1916, the Amagis are about a year or two younger than them, and the G3s are two or three years younger than the Amagis. So, as a result, there are going to be certain general changes in design style and pattern that would be most beneficial to the G3s and least beneficial to the Lexingtons. Although, as I said, you know, the Lexingtons do change considerably between 1916 and the 1920s, but that there's still an element of holdover in their designs. Another element is range. Of the three, the Lexingtons are designed to go the furthest. Their operational range is considerably further, two to 3,000 miles more, depending on the ship you're looking at, than the other two, which means it's got to carry a lot more fuel, fuel weighs a fair bit, fuel takes up volume, so there's more weight in the Lexingtons going towards fuel than there is in the other ships. Another matter is the propulsion system. Now, for all the swings and roundabouts, you can argue benefits or lack of benefits, compromises, strength, etc., of the turboelectric drive system, which is what the Lexingtons were designed to use, the One of the things that's pretty inarguable is that the turboelectric drive system is heavier than the geared turbine systems that the Amagis and the G3s were using. So for a given amount of displacement, a greater proportion of Lexington's weight is going to be made up of machinery weight, even assuming that they all the three ships were designed to produce the same amount of power, which they're not. Uh, this leads on to the other thing. The Lexingtons were originally supposed to be able to top 35 knots, hence the need for a massive amount of power. And this and the previous issue kind of end up reinforcing each other because it means that the Lexingtons need the most power, and they have the most power, even though they don't quite reach 35 knots, but near enough. Um eventually their design requirement is dropped to 33 knots but it turns out on trials they can do like 34 and a bit so anyway but as a res they have this 180,000 shaft horsepower power plant as a result of the original 35 knot speed requirement so as i said yes they have the the biggest power plant of the lot and it is also the heaviest power plant in terms of horsepower per ton of the lot so their machinery weight is well in excess of that required for the G3s or the Amagis, which also have lower speed requirements and therefore obviously need slightly less machinery. With the G3s in particular, a huge amount of testing went into their hull forms, which compared to the more conventional hull form layout of the, um, the Amagis and the Lexingtons, the G3s feature a number of additional features including a transom stern, which allows them to be considerably more efficient at high speed and also saves weight because, you know, there's a whole bit of stern that's not there and therefore doesn't weigh anything. So when you throw in the fact that the Lexingtons are kind of middle of the pack of the three when it comes to displacement, you start to understand why perhaps there wasn't enough mass left over for significantly upgrading the armor because at that point they're carrying you know several hundred if not thousand tons more fuel they've got several thousand tons more in the machinery department and as a result something's got to give uh, they've already as you mentioned they're already down a gun or two compared to the amagis and the g3s 
and what else are you going to do you know you, you've got speed protection and firepower the speed of the propulsion system is the thing that's causing a lot of the issues um as a whole you've your firepower's already pretty much at the minimum that you will want and therefore the protection has to drop um although to be fair the protection didn't really have fair, anywhere to drop from it was always fairly minimal and this is the other thing in terms of design philosophies the japanese were gradually moving towards the merger of the battleship and battle cruiser concept and so the difference in capabilities between the Amagis and the Tosas is considerably less than the difference in capabilities between, say, the Lexingtons and the South Dakotas, or the, even the G3s and the N3s. So Amagi is theoretically at least moving towards the fast battleship concept, and the G3s are built incredibly heavily for battle cruisers. You know, without the N3s, the G3s would be called fast battleships because well in terms of broad capabilities they're not far off something like an iowa uh, 20 years down the line they're basically an early 1920s version of an iowa and then you have the lexingtons which are designed again initially as part of the us's idea for a 35 knot scouting force along with the omahas and the wixes and clemsons and the us navy has in, at least initially this idea that well, if they're part of a scouting force with really fast destroyers and cruisers, then the only thing they should come across is really fast destroyers and cruisers, so we only need armor to protect against really fast destroyers and cruisers, which is okay as far as it goes, but seems a little bit naive to me, considering that, you know, other people can just build... You know, if you can build a fairly quick, large scouting cruiser, if you want to call it that then surely other people, as was kind of proven with the Amagas and G3s, can build nearly as quick, more substantial vessels, at which point you kind of need the protection. Um, speed is armour had, at that point, gone by the wind up by the bay way for a little while. General Dipper asks, I'm curious about naval examples of systems, I objects, things, that start out a bit rubbish but consistently improve with technological change to become legendary or at least good the lee enfield 303 or the sherman tank are things that got updated and improved over time on land i believe the spitfire showed marked improvement as well naval ships are big ticket items logically they should improve but i can't think of any legends in this regard part of that comes specifically from the fact that they're such big ticket items i.e they're so complex they're so involved that the margins of superiority over others of their own kind can get quite large and so if you have something that's not particularly brilliant to start with it can be an absolutely massive gap to cross just to get into the realms of acceptable let alone become really good um, so you can look at some of the modernizations of ships in the interwar period as an example so of course you've got war spite queen elizabeth valiant and renown all modernized to varying degrees, all become pretty good ships, especially Renown and Warspite. But, you know, the Queen Elizabeth class was pretty good to start with, so it was more of an update. They weren't rubbish. Um, Renown, perhaps, is a better example, because initially as built, uh, the Renown and Repulse did have a lot of issues. They had some issues, even similar to the Courageous and Glorious class, with being too lightly built. They weren't anywhere near protected enough. Um, they had some really, really awful secondaries in the shape of the triple four-inch. But once Renown had been modernised, well, refitted and modernised several times, so she was refitted to have better armour initially, and then, of course, she was modernised in the 1930s, replacing the awful secondaries with much better 4.5-inch twins and just generally rebuilt overall. So Renown in the Second World War was a far, far, far more capable vessel than the Renown of the latter part of the First World War. So I guess that's that's an example of a ship. Uh, an example of a system, whilst I wouldn't necessarily say it became legendary, it at least went from not brilliant to relatively good, would be the 5.25 inch uh, and a dual purpose gun as found on the king george v's and the vanguard 
part of it was the mounting. Um, Vanguard's mountings were just better overall. But part of it, as I've mentioned before, was the advent of radar-directed fire control. As long as you were using optical-directed fire control, then the 5-inch 38 was a far superior weapon because, you know, it not exactly, but broadly speaking, could chuck out an approximately, approximately equivalent shell, except it could do that a lot, lot faster, <laughs> which therefore made it a superior anti-aircraft weapon. Um, the 5.25 inch obviously had an advantage in anti-surface engagements, but yeah, neither here nor there. But once you got into radar fire control, then the fact the 5.25 inch had a slightly, you know, slightly longer barrel, it was a longer barrel weapon generally, and therefore could chuck shells faster on a slightly flatter profile. Although it didn't mean the 5.25 was better in the short to medium engagements that the 5-inch 38 could still dominate with its much better rate of fire, it did suddenly make, give the 5.25 a bit of a niche in a long-range anti-aircraft almost sniping role because its shells could reach out far enough and fast enough that with the increased accuracy provided by radar direct fire control, you could hit targets considerably further out than you could previously. But perhaps the single best example would be the 40mm Bofors. Now the 40mm Bofors existed for a reasonable amount of time before the First World War, obviously manufactured by the Swedes and licensed out to various people, but it didn't see a huge amount of proliferation before the war and you might look at its capabilities and go well why not surely you know it is a really really good weapon and it is the only problem is the original swedish flavor 40 mil bofors was a hideously complex weapon that was a huge huge maintenance hog amongst other things and that in large part was why not too many people were using them but then the US took the Bofors, basically took it apart, stripped it down, worked out how to simplify it and make it mass producible. And then all of a sudden it became pretty much the single best medium caliber anti-aircraft weapon of the entire Second World War and started to, prol to proliferate in huge, huge numbers. So I think if you're looking at a kind of a zero to hero story for any particular system, the 40 mil Bofors would probably be my pick. Fireteam Joker asks, was the rivalry between the Imperial Japanese Army and Imperial Japanese Navy really that bad? I know the army actually attacked itself during the Kyuzho incident, and many died, but I find it hard to believe a society that placed such high importance on honour and loyalty would be so dysfunctional. Yes, the rivalry between the Japanese Army and Navy really was that bad. Um, it, it is almost beyond belief uh, for people to hear about these days but effectively in a lot of ways the Japanese army and navy were two slightly differently focused military organizations who happened theoretically to be working for the same boss i.e the emperor um, they had completely different strategic visions for how Japan should expand its interests and they basically were completely unwilling uh, as far as they possibly could avoid it to help the other side in their aims so although the japanese navy does operate off of china which you know expansion into china guarding against the soviets is very much the army's thing um they're not really cooperating with the army that much and likewise getting the army to cooperate in the navy's expansion out into the southwest pacific is equally difficult about the only thing the, the army and navy both agreed on was grabbing the Dutch East Indies. And you can see that when you look at their complements of equipment. So obviously the navy has ships and the army has tanks and so forth, but they're much like actually the US in World War II. There is no separate air force. There's no imperial Japanese air force, the same as the US Army Air Force, USAAF, is the thing in uh, the USA, although of the USAAF has a little bit more uh, freedom, <laughs> shall we say, than the uh, from the army than the Imperial Japanese Army Air Service or the Imperial Japanese Navy Air Service. But when you look at British or American Navy and um, Air Force or Army Air Force designs, yes, 
They at times have different fighter craft, although they do share designs as well. And yes, they have different single engine strike aircraft, although again, occasionally designs are shared. But with the US and the UK, the Navy recognizes that heavyweight strategic bombing, you know, by twin or four engined heavy bombers, is best left to the Air Force or the Army Air Force. In Japan, that's not the case. They have two completely different development lines where the Japanese Navy has a ton of, well, three or four different designs of twin-engined and later on even a four-engined heavy bomber, which they use. And the Army has a bunch of twin-engined heavy bomber designs, which they use, which are completely different and for the most part manufactured by a completely different company. The Japanese Army really likes Kawasaki, uh, the Japanese Navy basically gets stuff manufactured by anyone but Kawasaki for the most part. There is a little bit of crossover in the bomber department in that both the Navy and the Army do use products made by Mitsubishi, but not the same product made by Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi is having to manufacture two different types of bomber for at pretty much the same time for the two different armed services. And things go on. I mean, Nakajima, I think it is, they have a factory that's producing fighters for the Navy, and they have a factory that's producing fighters for the Army. They are the same factory, but the factory is divided internally between Army and Navy with armed guards and each service forbidden to enter the other service's domain. Uh, and then, of course, you have the fact that the Japanese Army built itself its own amphibious landing fleet assault ships, escort carriers, etc. And whilst the, say, for example, the US Army would have control of some of the amphibious forces, you know, you don't really see US Army escort carriers, US Army destroyers, anti-sub warfare ships, etc., etc. That's the Navy's department. But no, the Army wanted its own self-contained amphibious assault force which meant, of course, the Navy had to have its own self-contained amphibious assault force, which meant the Navy had its own landing ships, again, somewhat different in design, and the Navy also had its own tanks, separate from the Army's tanks. <laughs> and the list goes on and on. Basically, you know, the Army had it most of the ground forces, the Navy had most of the sea forces, but both sides intruded extensively into the other's domain so that they could have their own versions and they were basically running two completely parallel air forces and now obviously you know it makes sense in some ways that you know kind of like you have the hellcats and corsairs in the u.s navy and you ha have the p-51s for the u.s army air force or the p-40 p-47 and wildcat in an, in earlier points in the war but you can have joint designs, the Sea Fire, for example. So, but fighter design, you can understand. You, the Navy might have the Zero, the the uh, Army might have something else. But when you're in the realms of both services having competing twin-engine land-based heavy bomber designs, yeah, there's there's far too much rivalry for it to be healthy. Paul from Chicago asks, I saw a model of HMS Unicorn on Twitter today and it looked like she was intended to have a complete spa deck. Did the later class have a complete spa deck or is this unique to Unicorn as a result of it being a depot ship? I saw a model of Trincomalee and she does not appear to have a full spa deck. When did the British start putting complete spa decks on their frigates? So Unicorn doesn't have a complete spa deck. Um, if you have a look at the video I did on Unicorn, then you'll see when you're internal, which is where this photo is taken, this is a, a model of Unicorn on board Unicorn, you'll actually see that although she has a complete roof, she does not have a full run spa deck. There is this gap uh, between, on Unicorn, where the fore and, mizzen, uh, fore and main masts would be, and on the model, the fore and main masts are in place. You can see there is this characteristic gap between the forward part of the spa deck and the aft part. Now, that is a common feature of British frigate design that goes surprisingly late on. So Trincomalee obviously has, is a completed later class and she has this gap. The first Royal Navy frigate class that 
has a full spar deck is the latter part of the 1810s with the Southampton class, although they are significantly large vessels. They're um, 52 gunners, and they have a complete spar deck, but it, that doesn't herald the start of the complete spar deck in the Royal Navy. Smaller frigates are, so fifth rates and the occasional sixth rate, are still being built with this gap, so a partial spar deck, well into the 1820s, 1830s, and even potentially the 1840s. It's only when you start to get to right towards the end of the sailing frigate as a concept period that you start to see the Royal Navy do full-length spar decks for its fifth rates and below. Although, as I said, when you're talking about the fourth rates, I 50 gunners and above, um, which would be broadly comparable to the US super frigates, considering that by this by the sort of late 1810s and, and going into the 1820s, the Royal Navy now, is now counting carronades as part of the ship's rated armament, which is a more accurate way of measuring things by that point, then those larger ships have, have introduced the spar deck, as I said, with the Southampton class much earlier. So it's a little bit varied. Smokey the Bear asks... What's the difference between a ship and a boat? Bad definitions from my experience in the US Navy include submarines are boats because ships aren't designed to sink, so boats are, um, or a more formal definition that may have been on an exam, a boat is anything that can be lifted out of the water and put on a ship, since, but then without limitations on the lifting method used, that means a battleship is a boat and a floating dry dock in which it sits is a ship. Have you run across a better definition? Well, I've heard a variant on the second one, which is that a ship is something that carries boats and a set, a floating vessel that is too small to carry a boat of its own is therefore itself a boat, which is a little bit of a tongue twister, but you, you get the general drift, which in theory explains why submarines are called boats, because submarines don't carry boats of their own although the flip side is of course now that you have underwater um escape dash recovery dash special operations vehicles strapped to the back of some submarines technically they are carrying their own small ancillary craft so the definition of a ship as something which carries its own small ancillary craft nowadays would technically make certain submarines ships uh, and not boats another definition that i've heard based more on the behavior of watercraft at speed is that if you put a floating vessel into a turn at speed a boat will turn will lean into the turn a ship will lean out of the turn i.e so if you're turning to port at speed and you're in a you know a small speedboat or something you will find that the port side i.e the inside track of the boat um, tips downwards and the starboard outside tips upwards whereas if you are in a large ship like a carrier for example you put it into a hard port side turn the starboard side is the side that tips over which i suppose is a relatively creditable way of doing things although again there is probably going to be a bunch of exceptions to that you'll probably find um some relatively small craft that one would usually define as boats especially perhaps in the sailing department that will tip out outwards when they turn at speed and you'll possibly find some fairly large high performance craft that might tip inwards at speed it all depends on the underwater profiles and this is kind of the problem in that ships and boats are so diverse that trying to come up with any one hard and fast rule that defines the two will almost always have exceptions come up. Another one I've seen is boats navigate inland waterways, ships navigate on the sea. But again, that doesn't explain submarines or ships' boats. Um, and also there are some pretty hefty things on inland waterways, like on the Great Lakes, which are very definitely ships. And to be honest, a lot of this rests in the fact that the term ship was never meant to be a kind of a binary distinction ship versus boat ship was defined in its original form by the rigging and the number of masts so you would have a ship rigged vessel 
and that became a ship. You could have, a, and then below that, you could have a brig rigged vessel, a sloop rigged vessel, etc., etc. And in the old school days, at least as far as I can tell, a boat was something that didn't have a sail at all. So something that was purely oar powered, which I mean, ships' boats usually were, would be a boat. And then you'd have sloops and brigs and snows and cutters and so forth. And then you'd have the ship, which, again, has various definitions through time, but usually was three masts and square yard arms. So there you go. So I think the the line nowadays is a little bit blurry, thanks to the fact that we have taken a system of definition that relied entirely on sail rigging and have tried to adapt it to an era where we don't have sail rigging and we've also ditched a bunch of the intermediate terms. Jeffrey Conley asks, how good of a gun was the US Navy's 18-inch gun? Was it ever tested and how would it have stacked up compared to the Japanese 18-inch gun? So the US Navy's 18-inch gun existed in a couple of different forms, which does make comparison a little bit bit harder because it's an older weapon designed originally in the 1920s, much the same as the British 18-inch gun was designed for the N3s at that time period. It was then modified uh, later on in World War II. Well, it was modified into a 16-inch gun first, and then it was re-re-modified into an 18-inch um, of a slightly different type with a different shell in the World War II period. And so th there's a limited amount of testing, a limited amount of data that's available so in comparison to the period 18-inch rival, which would be the British one designed for the N3s, they're actually remarkably similar. The muzzle velocity is pretty much identical at about 2,700 feet per second. The weight of the projectile, 2,900 pounds, is near enough the same. Uh, the American shell, however, carries a 100-pound bursting charge as opposed to the British shell, which carries somewhere between 70 and 80 pound bursting charge so all things considered the american shell should do slightly more damage when it explodes um, but there's not really any available armor piercing uh, data test uh, significant testing at least having been done so it's not really possible to say if this would in any way this sort of the only difference being the amount of explosive inside if that would in any way shape or form affect the armor penetration capabilities i suspect not but then you have once it's been redeveloped in the second world war and shockingly enough they go for a super heavy shell and that is a lot lot heavier it's 3850 pounds um shockingly you know the breach size hasn't increased so muzzle velocity drops to 2400 uh, feet per second and the explosive payload drops to 68 pounds but that now allows us to compare it with the japanese 18.1 inch gun which is of course a world war ii period gun so it's actually quite useful having two separate uh, ways to compare things now the japanese shell weighs just over 3,200 pounds, the armor-piercing variety, so it's uh, somewhat lighter. It's The Japanese shell has a slightly higher bursting charge, now at, at just about 75 pounds as compared to the 68, although it's not a huge difference. Um, and the muzzle velocity, as you might expect, for the Japanese shell is a bit higher, just over 2,500 feet per second, which isn't surprising considering the shell is about 600 pounds lighter. Um, and whilst we do have theoretical calculated values for and test values for armor penetration for the Japanese gun, once again, we don't really have much of anything for the American gun. And of course, in the wonderful way of things, the sets of data that are available for the Japanese gun in terms of armor penetration vary quite significantly. So... Um, exactly what its capabilities are relative to the US gun will remain forever unknown, but I would broadly expect that once you get to the mid 20,000s of yards and above, the American gun is probably going to perform somewhat better at deck penetration because it's you know, slower muzzle velocity, um, heavier shell, it's going to drop in 
at a higher angle, um, whereas the slightly greater muzzle velocity and still substantial weight of the Japanese APC shell will probably mean it might have slightly superior characteristics below the mid 20,000s of yards for belt armor penetration. So actually, you know, compared to both the early 20s and early 40s guns that it would be competing against, I'd say that the American 18-inch gun broadly stacks in its two different forms as comparable, albeit that, you know, that's based on very limited data. Guz Rizbos asks, if you compare armed forces at the start of World War I versus the end of World War I, you can see the army and air forces of the various countries involved changed quite radically. However, when looking at the naval side, large parts remain the same. Mostly submarines and anti-submarine warfare had changed. Why was this? Was the Navy the only part of the armed forces that correctly predicted how warfare was evolving, or did lessons learned during the war just take a really long time to implement? I think part of it is related to a question that someone else asked earlier about Navy ships being long-term investments. So, you know, the tank didn't exist at the start of World War One. then it did. The aircraft in military use kind of existed, but effectively didn't. But at the end of World War One, you had fighters, bombers and all sorts. Whereas battleships, cruisers and destroyers they all existed at the start of World War One, and for the most part, they still existed at the end of World War One. But because of their sheer size, some of the changes are a little bit more subtle, a little bit harder to detect. Um, now, obviously, you, you also have the fact that the most of the major warring nations suspended, at least in part, their significant building programs during the war, which made it much harder for anybody to, you know, look at what would have been the successor to the revenge class and the, the successor to that successor and the successor to that successor you know we don't know because the revengers would have been the well renowned repulse and resistance as originally marketed and agincourt as her qe variation um, version would have been built in 1914 and then we would have a 15 16 17 and 18 era warships but we don't because the war stopped those constructions hood however was a mid-war design and you know hood is a substantial change away from both battlecruiser and battleship design from the start of the war so that's an example of progress but you also have things like anti-aircraft guns being introduced you have director fire control and range finders improving for the capital ships and actually being distributed to some of the rest of the fleet at the beginning of the war not even all the capital ships had range fighters and central fire control let alone cruisers and so forth um, the cruiser has also evolved it's gotten substantially larger it's breached 5,000 tons um, well the evolution of the protected cruiser i.e the light armored cruiser aka eventually the light cruiser has done that the armored cruiser has gone extinct uh, although the battle cruiser was already kind of seeing to that um, gun size has gone up so you're, we're beginning to see the prototypes of light and heavy cruisers at the end of world war ii at least in the design form uh, at the end of world war one sorry in design form as compared to at the beginning where you're still looking at essentially evolutions of the protected cruiser and in cruiser world you're also seeing the beginnings of people looking at twin turrets and all centerline armament mostly in the germany for that to be fair to them um, but centerline twin turrets and so forth are definitely coming in in cruisers destroyers have gotten larger and the thoughts about how to use capital ships etc have changed quite significantly as well so there, there is a fair amount of change that's going on but a lot of it is individual systems with the occasional ship like hood showing up so because of that and because as i said these things already existed beforehand in some way shape or form it seems a lot more iterative but there was a significant amount of improvement developed both during the war and lessons from the war being applied to designs that were on the drawing board when the war ended.